Howdy folks, welcome to version 1 of the Network Plus practice questions. As you can see on the screen, these practice questions are specifically for the N10-009 version of the Network Plus exam. But they will actually also work for the other versions of the Network Plus exam. So if you're perhaps studying for an older version or a newer version of the Network Plus exam, Yes, these questions will still apply to those exams as well, and you can use them to prepare for those exams. And at the end of the day, folks, the practice questions still measure you on the same skills, and they still cover mostly the same objectives. Now, in case anyone is wondering if these are the actual questions from the actual exam, no, they are not. It's not allowed by the vendor, and most vendors actually won't allow that. These do, however, measure you on the same skills, and the same objectives. If you understand the actual topics and the concepts themselves, then yes, you're ready to go and write the exam. If you, however, still feel uncomfortable with some of the topics and concepts, then please do not go and write the exam just yet. I would rather suggest for you to go and study a little bit longer. Rather go study some more until you feel comfortable with all the topics and concepts you see here in these videos of mine, the idea here, folks, is for you to actually understand the topics and the concepts in this course. And once you eventually have that under the belt, then you'll be fine in the exam, no matter how the vendor decides to throw these questions at you. Now, if you're not sure where to start, if you're struggling with your studies, I would suggest you start specifically with the topics you're struggling with, or you can just join my Discord server and ask for assistance there. There are always lots of folks on there that are more than willing to help you with explanations, and that includes myself. You can find that video in the video description down below. Now, speaking of the exam objectives, folks, you can actually find that very easily by just running a search in a search engine of your choice for CompTIA Network Plus N10-009 exam objectives. Alternatively, you can just use the link in my video description. I'm going to add a link for you guys in the video description down below. So here is more or less what it looks like. So after I opened it, after running a search for it, this is more or less what you guys can expect to see in the exam objective. So let me just very briefly scroll through here. So you guys can see, you're gonna have a maximum of 90 questions in this official exam. There's going to be performance-based questions. You're gonna have a maximum of 90 minutes to complete that. So that's about an hour and a half. There are the domains that's going to be covered. Now that on its own seems pretty simple, but if we scroll a little bit down, a little bit more here, you can see there is the first domain, networking concepts, and there's a subsection. So the first subsection is the OSI model. We obviously covered that already in my video course. Subsection two, subsection three. So you can see each of these sections has little subsections of lots and lots of topics that's going to be covered. So if you want to know what's going to be covered, what objectives you're going to be measured on in the N10-009 version of the exam, Please go have a look at these objectives and then you can get a better idea of what you're going to be tested on. Now, the video that you guys are watching right now, my aim here is to measure you guys on the same objectives, measure you on the same skills. Now, I've made 70 questions in this video, but using just 70 questions is sometimes a little tricky to test you on all of these objectives. So I might need to do two or three videos because um, honestly, I don't think I covered all of these objectives. I think I missed a quite a few. So I'm going to have to make a second and a third video to cover all of these objectives. But for the time being, this is the first video. This is why I say this is version one. There's going to be a version two and probably a version three as well, depending on how many questions I need to cover all of the objectives. And once I've done that, then after watching those videos, you should be ready to go and write the exam. So I think that's going to help you guys a lot once I've got all those videos up and going. And uh, I think now that we've got all of this blah, blah out of the way, if you folks haven't done it already, please do your homie here a favor and like this video. It helps me and it helps the channel out. And if you folks would like to know when I release more of these practice questions, version two and version three, or just in general training videos for that matter, then maybe also consider subscribing. Otherwise you might miss it. All right, folks, I think we've talked enough in this intro. Let's go look at question one. The first question here says, you are teaching a new junior technician at Burning Ice Tech how to crimp a normal crossover network cable. Which of the following cable configurations is correct? Now, what I'm going to try and achieve in this question is to see if you guys understand the difference between a straight through cable as well as a crossover cable. And if you know how to go and do the configuration for a crossover cable. 
You need to understand this for the exam, folks, because this is something they're going to expect you to understand and know in the official exam. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to do four drawings for you guys. So there's going to be four drawings. And um, obviously, since the drawings are going to go quite fast, I encourage you guys to pause the video if need be. So once the first drawing is done, pause the video for a second or two and check the configuration. Check if you think that's correct or not. Then move on to the second configuration. Pause the video. Check what you think of the configuration, whether you think it's correct or not. Same happens at configuration three. Same happens at configuration four. And after the fourth configuration shows on the screen, I'm going to give you guys the four configurations and you're going to have to choose an answer. After you've chosen what you think the answer would be, I'm going to let you guys know what the answer is and I'm going to explain to you why. So there's going to be four drawings. Please feel free to pause the video on a drawing if you need to. If you don't, that's fine. You can just go and watch it and yeah, if you can check it out that quickly, then sure, go for it. All right, so starting with configuration A. Um, as you guys can see, I'm going to put eight pins on the left and eight pins on the right. And if you're not sure what that is for, that is for a normal network cable of an RJ45 connector. Each of these eight pins is an RJ45 connector. So the eight pins on the left, that's one connector. And the eight pins on the right, that's a different connector. So this is a crossover cable. And I'm going to draw some lines here. There we go. Totally random lines. It might be correct. It might not be correct, but if you understand crossover cables, you would know whether this is correct or not. All right, take a moment, take it in. Okay, let's move on to configuration B, folks. Now, for configuration B, once again, the same eight pins on both sides. This time, there we go. I'm going to draw the lines a little bit differently for you guys. So the pins are connected differently this time. Take a moment, take it in, check if you think it's correct. All right, I'm going to move on to configuration C now, folks. All right, so configuration C, same story as before. Eight pins on each side. Here's the lines. Pause if you need to. All right, after you've taken it in, let's move on to configuration D. All right, here's the last one, folks. Configuration D, eight pins on each side. I'm going to draw some lines randomly to some random pins. It might be correct. It might not be correct. Only I know which one is correct. And if you studied, you would know as well which one is correct. All right, folks, I'm going to take you back to my initial question, which I sucked out of my thumb. Here is the four configurations, A all the way through to D. Now, if you paid attention, you would know which one is the answer here. So if you want, you can shout out the answer in your head now if you want to. So I'm going to tell you guys what the answer is. The answer was configuration B. Now, if you don't understand why, let me bring configuration B back on the screen. There we go. I'm going to draw the lines again for you guys. There we go. Now, for crossover cable, folks, pin 1 and 2 are senders. Pin 3 and 6 are receivers. And 4 and 5, they just stay the same. And 7 and 8 just stay the same. They're generally used for speed and that kinds of stuff. So, pin 1 on the left, which is a sender, needs to go to pin 3 on the right, which is a receiver. Pin 2 on the left, which is a sender, needs to go to pin 6 on the right, which is a receiver. And the same can be said about the right-hand side. If you look at the right-hand side, pin 1, which is a sender, goes to pin 3 on the left, which is a receiver. And if you look at the right-hand side, pin 2, which is a sender, it goes to pin 6 on the left, which is a receiver. And then everything else just stays the same. So that is the configuration for a normal crossover cable, folks. That's why the answer was configuration B. All right, cool. Let's move on to question two. Which of the following network attacks usually takes place by overloading a server, a service, or a website with so much traffic to the point where it times out or crashes? Now, what kind of attack do you guys think that is? All right, so here's the possible answers on the screen for you guys. Is it A, a ransomware attack? No, guys, it's not a ransomware attack. So for those of you that don't know, ransomware attacks normally goes and encrypts everything on your machine or a company's network. So if you happen to get this on your own personal laptop, one of the first things you'll notice is everything on your laptop is encrypted. Some of them allow you to browse around, some of them don't. Generally, what you'll also see is there's going to be some sort of prompt on the screen which is going to tell you to go and pay the ransom, normally in a cryptocurrency of some sort, probably something like Bitcoin, and they normally give you a deadline. You've got to go and pay this ransom within about two days, three days or so, 
failing which they threaten to go and delete all your data. Now, if you happen to get this in a company environment, oh boy, trust me, you don't want to get that. Then you better hope you've got backups. So nowhere does ransomware overload a service. It just encrypts your data and it wants a ransom in the form of cryptocurrency. If you look at answer B, virus, that is normally a form of code with malicious intent. And its intent is not to overload something, but instead just to do some sort of harm on your machine or a server. So it's generally code with malicious intent. So the answer is not A, the answer is not B. If you look at answer C, a DDoS attack. Now DDoS is short for distributed denial of service attack. And this is normally done by using a botnet. Now, for those of you that don't know what a botnet is, it's basically a network of lots and lots of computers that's been infected of malware. And these machines that's now been infected of malware, they're doing someone's bidding. The person that created this malware, this bot network is probably doing his or her bidding. So this person can go and use this massive network of machines that's now infected to go and crack passwords, to go and do mass phishing attacks, mass spam attacks, and mass denial of service attacks. Yep, that's the answer here, folks. So that botnet has got lots and lots of machines. This can be hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of even. And these machines are all going to visit the same server, the same service or same website. It's going to visit them all at the same time. And it's going to overload this website or server with so much freaking traffic to the point where it cannot cope with the load. And it's going to either time out or it's going to crash. Now, the last answer there, we already know it's not the answer, but just in case you guys are wondering what the rainbow table attack is, that is a form of a password attack. You get many forms of password attacks, and that's one of the less dangerous ones these days. I wouldn't say it's not dangerous. It's still very dangerous, but it's not as dangerous as it used to be because these days we've got custom banned password lists and global banned password lists, if you guys know what that is. So a rainbow table attack is when a hacker or an attacker has got a predefined list of passwords that they know for a fact is very likely to be successful. So this list might literally just be 10 passwords. And if I know you very well, or I know your company very well, or if I understand a product or a service very well, I might know what the default passwords are, or I might know what password someone or something might use. So basically, it is passwords that's very likely to be successful. That is a rainbow table attack, folks. All right, let's move on to question three, folks. You are busy configuring a new switch, and you want to connect two ports to the core switch to ensure redundancy. Which of the following would allow you to do this? Now, if you don't know what a core switch is, that's the main switch. So this pretend company of mine has got multiple switches in it, and the core switch is going to be the main switch. And the switch you're trying to connect is just one of many. Now, what this person wants to achieve here, or what we need to achieve here, is we want to go and connect multiple cables between these two switches. Normally, it would just be one cable. Now, if something were to happen to that cable, someone unplugs it, it gets damaged, or let's say one of the ports blows on one of these switches, that's a problem because the link between these two switches is now going to be broken. But if you've got two cables plugged onto both sides, that's going to give you a form of redundancy, or should I say fault tolerance. Now, looking at the list down below, folks, what will allow you to achieve that goal? Is it answer A, VLANs? Now, for those of you that don't know, VLANs is short for virtual LANs. That gives you or someone the ability to go and create multiple virtual networks inside your physical network. So if you ever find yourself in a pickle of a situation where you now suddenly need multiple networks in your building when you just have one, instead of having to go and install additional switches and additional network cables and all that, I mean, that, guys, is going to take a lot of time, a lot of effort. It's going to cost you a lot of money. Instead of doing that, why not use the existing infrastructure in your network? So instead of installing additional physical networks, you can go and use the existing infrastructure and create multiple virtual networks within that physical network. Now, answer A has got nothing to do with this redundancy that we want. It's just going to allow you to have multiple virtual networks. It's got nothing to do with redundancy. Looking at answer B, link aggregation. Now, folks, that actually is the answer in this scenario. It's actually also known as port aggregation. And in some cases, this might even be referred to as NIC teaming. It's got multiple names. 
So you can go look it up on Google if you want to, or you can go check in your manual. It's referred to as link aggregation. Some people call this port aggregation, and some people call this nick teaming. I'm specifically mentioning all these names to you guys because I don't know which one CompTIA might decide to go and ask you guys in the exam. So on the off chance, they might ask you the other one or the other one. Then at least you know which is which. It all means the exact same thing. So link aggregation, folks, is when you take two cables or more between two switches and you go and make them clones, for lack of a better description. So I've got two switches, like in this question of mine. One is the main switch in this pretend company of mine. The other one is just a random switch. I've got two cables into the core switch, two cables into the other switch, and these two cables are doing the exact same thing. It's a backup link. So they're splitting the load. So that's another benefit you actually get out of this. It gives you a form of load balancing. They're splitting the load. You're going to get more speed out of this connection now since there's two cables between these two switches. And in the event of one of these cables breaking or failing for whatever reason, then the link is not going to break between these switches. The users will still be able to do whatever they were trying to do in the beginning, and they're never going to be the wiser. At the worst case scenario, the link might just be a little bit slower, but at the end of the day, at least the users can still do what they need to do. That's what we want. So, yeah, we already know the answer is B. Answer C, guys, ACLs. That is short for Access Control Lists. You can do this in multiple places, but this is most commonly done on a network switch. Not all switches allow this. You can only do this on a managed switch. An unmanaged switch is a cheap switch which doesn't really allow you to do much. You just plug into it and that's it. A managed switch, they cost a lot of money. You get different brands, you get different models, and um, depending on the brand and the model, you'll have the ability to go and log into it, and you'll have the ability to go and configure what we call access control lists. In a nutshell, it allows you to control the flow of traffic. I can choose where people are allowed to come from and where they're allowed to go to, and depending on where they're coming from, I might allow them to go to the destination they want to go to, or I might not allow them to go to the destination they want to go to. So in short, I can control the flow of traffic on my network. I decide what's allowed and what's not allowed, depending on where they're coming from and where they're going to. The last answer there, folks, P-O-E. That is short for power over Ethernet. This can be a small actual device which can fit in the palm of your hand. Those you'll generally find only in someone's home environment or a very small office environment. More commonly, PoE is something you guys are going to find on a network switch. So if the network switch supports PoE, usually on the front of the switch, it's going to have PoE written on the front very clearly. And that means it sends power into the Ethernet cables. Now, Ethernet cables on its own already does have a little bit of power in them, but it's not enough to power up any device. So if you ever find yourself in a pickle of a situation where you've got a device where you can plug a network cable into it, but it's not near any power, this can solve that problem. Two such examples would be access points and VoIP phones, especially access points. Where do you normally find access points? High up on the ceiling. Now, getting a network cable there is not a problem because we often put them in the walls and in the ceiling. But do you have a socket there, a power socket that you can plug that access point into? Usually not. So funny enough, these access points in the box of the access point, it actually comes with a little uh, power cable and all that, but I don't know where they expect us to plug that into because normally we put these access points high up on the ceiling somewhere. So you're probably going to end up having to power this, de this device via the network cable. And on its own, the network cable is not going to be able to do that. So you're going to have to jack it up a little bit with power. So you are going to have to plug that network cable not just into any switch, but a switch that has PoE capability. So when you plug that cable into a PoE switch, it's still going to be able to transfer data like usual, but now it also sends power into that network cable, powering up the device. As soon as you plug the network cable into it, it's going to power up that access point or it's going to power up that VoIP phone. And that's pretty much what it is in a nutshell, folks. All right, folks, let's move on to question four. You're busy setting up email for a user and you need to ensure that the user is using secure email. Which of the following ports is used for secure email? So we're not necessarily asking you which ports are for email. Um, I'm asking you which port is for secure email. Now looking at the port numbers down below, folks, which port number do you guys think that is? If you look at the first port number there, being 25, that actually is for email, but it's not for secure email. 25 is for SMTP. That's clear text as well. So it's not secure. 
If you look at the second answer there, 110, that is also for email, that is for POP3, but it's not secure, it's not encrypted, it's just normal clear text. So 25 is SMTP, that's in clear text, 110 is POP3, which is also in clear text. If you look at port 143, what is that for? That is for IMAP, folks, but it's also still in clear text. It's not secure. And if you look at the very last port number there, folks, yes, that indeed is a secure port number. It's the only one here which is actually encrypted. So it uses something called TLS, or should I say Secure Socket Layer, SSL. Um, it's a form of encryption, so it uses TLS or SSL. And um, this is pretty much the only port out of this lot here which is actually considered secure. So if you want to go and use secure email, that's the one you would go and use. Alternatively, you folks could have also gone and used a port like 993. That's also considered a secure encrypted port. But um, all the other ports I listed here for you guys, no, those are not secure. It's only the last one which is actually secure here. So that's a very quick question. Some of them are going to go very quick. Some of them are going to take quite a while to explain like you guys saw the previous three questions. Moving on to question five. You have two internet links at your office that share the load. And you also have a web application with poor performance. Which of the following tools can you use to determine which link is being used for web application? All right, so we want to determine which link is actually being used for a web application. Now, if you look at answer A, folks, what does that command do? So everything I've got there for you guys are commands that you would normally go run in command prompt. Good old-fashioned CMD, as some of you guys know it. Now, the first command I've got there for you guys is ping. That's a command you would go type into command prompt to go and test remote connectivity between two machines. In the old days, we would say between two computers, but nowadays it's not limited to computers because it can be anything for that matter. So if I run that command on one computer, it's going to send four packets of data, very, very small packets of data to a remote destination. And if this communication and it's configured correctly, all four packets of data will return. It's going to say reply, reply four times. These packets will also tell you how long they have taken to reply. Ideally, you want to see that in a couple of milliseconds. But if you do get four replies, but they take long to reply, that could indicate that your configuration is correct, but something else is wrong. There's maybe a lot of latency on your network for some apparent reason. If you, for example, get replies, but you don't get four replies, but you only get three replies, that can also indicate that your configuration is correct, but something else is influencing your cable, perhaps. That could be EMI, perhaps, electromagnetic interference. So yeah, running the ping command can really tell you a lot about your connectivity to a remote device. But that command, folks, is not going to allow you to see which link is associated with a web application. Now, if you look at the second command there, trace cert, a lot of people have said over the years this can be used to trace someone. Yes and no, it's not the best way to go and do that. So if you go and type that command into command prompt, followed by space, followed by the IP address or the website address of the item you want to trace, it's going to trace it up to a maximum of 50 hops. At least that's what they say. Each of these hops is apparently a router, which is not entirely true. It can sometimes be a firewall or something you've got to go through. So the first hop would usually be your router it's got to go through. The second hop might be your ISP's router, and the third hop will be whatever is beyond your ISP. Now, should you find yourself in a situation where you've got a medium to a large size company, where you've got a huge firewall, it's probably going to be your firewall, the first hop, followed by your router. So one of those first two hops is going to be your firewall. Um, the other one's going to be your own internal um, router. And only the third one will be your ISP. So just something to keep in mind. And that actually is the answer here, folks. Trace it can be used to determine which link is being used for a web application, just in case you're wondering. It's going to trace it up to a maximum of 50 hops. Um, usually you'll see it's only going to trace up to about approximately 10 hops that it's going to tell you where your destination is. So if I type in trace it and I, for example, type in www.google.com, it's going to tell me what Google's IP address is. It's going to trace it. And the same can be done for lots of other things, you know, devices. I mean, obviously, we know it's going to work for websites and all that. So you can determine what link is being used. If you look at the other two commands here, which has not really got anything to do with this question, 
ipconfig, folks, is a command you'll type into command prompt to show you a machine's most basic networking configuration. So it's going to show you that machine's IP address, if it has one. It's going to show you its subnet mask, a default gateway, and that's about it. It's not going to show you a lot. If you were to go type ipconfig forward slash all, it's going to show you the same information, but much more. It will also show you the physical address of that machine. It's going to show you whether it's a dynamic IP or a static IP. A lot more information, but that's not an actual answer here. I'm just putting it out there. So ipconfig is just to show you a machine's basic native information. If you look at the last command there, nslookup. Now, that is used for DNS purposes, folks. So you can actually go and look up a DNS record. So if I've got an IP address and I want to know what, let's say, what website this IP address belongs to. I can go and use NSLOOKUP to go and check who or what website this IP address belongs to. If I have a website address, but I don't have the IP address, I can go and use NSLOOKUP to go and check what the IP address for a website is. So you can go and use it vice versa. It's going to go pull the record and you can go and check information about that. So, I mean, remember, remember, what's the DNS's purpose, folks? The DNS's purpose is, in a nutshell, to convert IPs to names and names to IPs. It's not the only thing it does. It does a heck of a lot more than that. But in a nutshell, that's what it does. So when you go to your browser and you type in www.youtube.com, your computer doesn't actually know what that is or where that is. And your machine is going to contact something called the DNS, the DNS will pull the record for YouTube.com. It's going to check what the IP address for YouTube.com is. It's going to tell your machine what that IP address is. And your machine is going to follow that IP address. Something your machine can actually understand. So it converted the name to the IP address. Now this can be done in reverse as well. And this is done using the NS lookup tool, folks. So once again, the answer is B. Trace it. Moving on to question six. Your users are being diverted to entirely different websites than what they initially typed into the address bar of their web browsers. What type of attack is this? All right, so looking at the first answer I've got for you guys here, spoofing, what is that? Spoofing, folks, is pretending to be something you're not. So I can, for example, go and spoof an IP address. I can go and spoof a MAC address. I can go and spoof a website. I can go and spoof an email address, a phone number. There's a lot of things I can go and spoof. So I'm making something look like one thing when it's actually something else. So I can, for example, spoof your IP address and I can go and do something naughty now. And when someone wants to go and investigate afterwards, they're going to see your IP address there, not mine. Or I can go and spoof your computer's MAC address, which apparently can't be changed. But let me tell you, you can go and change it if you know how. So I can go and spoof your MAC address and I can get past things like MAC filters. Or once again, I can go and commit a crime of some kind and I can make it look like it was you. I can go and spoof an email address. And when you receive an email address, it's going to look like it's coming from one person when in reality it's coming from me. I can make it look like it's coming from your bank. It's going to look exactly like it's coming from your bank. Meanwhile, it's not coming from your bank. That's spoofing, folks. Very dangerous thing to go and do. And you'll often find that people combine spoofing with other forms of attack like phishing. Now, phishing is not an answer here right now. Now, spoofing might sound like the answer, but it's not. Spoofing does not divert you. It just pretends to be one thing when it's actually not. But it does not have the ability to actually divert you. So we're still going to have to go and do some other form of attack to first divert you to my spoofed website. So I can go and make a fake website. I can make a fake Facebook site, and that will be considered spoofing. But I still need a means or a ways to get you to set fake Facebook website. And that does not form part of spoofing. That's going to be something entirely different. So, yeah. Now, looking at the second answer here, guys, DOS. That is short for denial of service. So that is normally a form of attack where I or the perpetrator will deny you access to some sort of service. It's normally a basic service. This basic service could be your printer. So you've got a printer installed. It's on. It's ready. It's hot to go. But when you go and click on the print button, nothing happens. It just tells you no printer is installed or literally just nothing happens. And that could be a result of me turning off the print spooler service on your computer. If you don't know what the print spooler service is, that's a service that's running on all computers, regardless of whether you've got a printer or not, regardless of whether it's turned on or not. 
it's just there by default, folks. It's always going to be there. And if you happen to actually have yourself a printer, then that, that service is actually going to serve some sort of purpose. But if you don't, it's just going to idle in the background. Now, if the print spooler service is not running, then you won't be able to print. It's essentially the queue to your printer. So if you click on print, whatever you're printing is going to go into the print spooler first, which is the queue. And if this printer is yours and you're the only one using it, it's going to immediately go out of the queue again. But the queue still needs to be running for you to be able to print, even though you're the only one in that queue. Now, a lot of denial of service attacks will turn off basic services like the print spooler service. And when you click on print, it's not going to work. So I'm denying you the service of being able to print. This can also potentially be me blocking you from an internal website or a public website, you know, or some other basic server or service in your environment. That is all an example of a denial of service attack. Now, that's got nothing to do with this question. This question is about people being diverted to different websites than what they intended to visit. Denial of service does not do that. It's just going to block you entirely from going to our website. If you folks look at the third answer there, DNS poisoning. Now, that, folks, is actually the answer here. So if you remember what I said in the previous questions, DNS, its basic purpose is to convert IPs to names and names to IPs. So if you go to your browser right now and you go and type in YouTube.com, remember your machine doesn't know what that is or where that is. So your machine is going to ask what? It's going to ask the DNS what that is and where that is. And when it asks the DNS, the DNS goes and pulls the record for that respective website. And when it pulls that record in the record, it's going to look up the IP address for that website and it's going to give that IP address to your machine and your machine is going to follow that IP address and it's going to get to that website. Now, what DNS poisoning does, and that's the answer here, like I said, someone or something went and altered one or more of your DNS records, possibly all of them for all I know. So when your DNS goes and pulls the record for YouTube.com and it sees the IP address supposedly for YouTube.com, it's actually not the IP address for YouTube.com. Someone or something altered these records and changed the official IP addresses of those websites to an IP address of a fake website or just in general a different website. So now your DNS does not know that it's giving you the wrong IP address. So when I type in YouTube.com, my DNS pulls the record for YouTube.com. It sees the IP address that it assumes is YouTube's IP address. It gives that to your machine and your machine follows that route and loads that page. Meanwhile, that page is not YouTube.com. It's an entirely different website. It can be a fake YouTube.com or it can be an entirely different website altogether. That is DNS poisoning. Now, the last answer there, we know that's not the answer since I told you guys the answer is C, social engineering. That is tricking people into doing something. So I can, for example, add you on a social media website like Facebook. I could pretend to be your friend. And after a couple of days or a couple of weeks or months of talking to you, I'm going to get all kinds of sensitive information out of you. That could be the answers to your security questions, perhaps. I'm tricking you. Another form of social engineering could be maybe I am in a parking lot. Maybe this is the basement parking lot of a big office building. And to get up in the building, you need to go through access control doors. These doors, I don't know, they can ask a pen, a smart card, a fingerprint. The point is these doors are not going to open for some people that do not work in that building. Now, I'm going to be in the basement. I can't get past this door because I don't work there. But I'm going to wait until I see someone else opening this door. And as I see someone else opening the door, I'm going to say, Hey, okay, okay, can you hold the door for me quick, please, sir? And that person's going to feel inclined to hold the door open for me because that's what people do. We, we're going to feel like, okay, let me help this person out. It looks like they've got their hands full. So what I can even do is I can add on to this and make sure my hands are full of something. Make sure I'm carrying a big box. Meanwhile, this box is empty. And you're going to see, oh, shucks, this person's hands are full. That's why they want me to hold the door open for them. I've just tricked you into holding the door open for me. Meanwhile, there's nothing in the box. I don't even work there. I just needed you to hold the door open for me so I can get into the building. So that's one example of many I can give you of social engineering, folks. All right, moving on to question seven, people. Which of the following network topologies requires the most connections when being implemented? Now, to be clear here, guys, what I mean by connections is the network cables between devices. 
So a LAN cable from one machine to another machine or from one switch to another switch, for example. That's what I mean by connections in this question of mine. So which of the following topologies do you guys think requires the most connections? Now, these topologies is literally one of the very first things you would normally learn in a networking course. So I hope you guys know what it means. Otherwise, you guys are going to have to go and look at this video in my video course. So starting with the first answer there, a bus topology. That is not the answer, folks. A bus topology is generally in a straight line. At least the concept is in a straight line. It's one connection between, you know, machines, as you guys can see here in my diagram. So I'm going to put it here on the screen for you guys. There we go. That is a bus topology. So it's going to be minimal connections. It's, there's hardly any. Now, it's got benefits. It's got drawbacks. Benefits is this is a very affordable um, way of connecting machines. It's probably one of the cheapest ones. Downsides is there's pretty much just downsides. It's a very unreliable one. So if the link goes down at one machine, it's down for pretty much everybody in this thing. The second one we've got here is a ring topology. So devices are connected in a circular format. So it might not be an actual circle in real life. It's just a concept as a circle. And um, generally just one machine can communicate at a time and that can be a problem. So in the old days, 20, 30 years ago, when people didn't exactly have computers, and if they did, they hardly ever were on any form of network. Back then, this kind of sort of still worked. But nowadays, with everybody being on networks, everybody being online, and everybody communicating the whole time, a ring topology absolutely would not work. Everybody needs to communicate at the exact same time. So ring topologies just won't work. Benefit, very affordable. Downside is only one person can communicate or one device can communicate at a time. And if the link goes down, everybody is down once again. So that is a problem. Uh, the third topology we've got there, star topology, is actually the most commonly used topology till this day. But it is not the answer. The answer is mesh topology. Now, star topology, though, that which is not the answer, there's a central connected device. That's normally a switch, a hub, a router it's most commonly going to be something like a switch. So that's a central point of failure. All your devices are connected in a star format. Now in real life, it's not really going to look like a star. It's just a concept as a star. All your devices, all your laptops and desktop computers and whatnot, they're all connected of their own individual cables to one central point, which is generally going to be a switch. The benefits here is it's not the most expensive network. It's also not the cheapest. But it's still decently affordable. And if one of these cables for one of these machines happens to go down, break or whatever, it's only going to affect that one computer. Not everybody else, just that one computer, which is what we want. The only real point of failure here is that central point of failure being the switch. So God forbid, if something happens to that switch in the middle, everybody's going to be offline. The good news is switches are very quick and easy to go and replace. So you just go and unplug it, plug all the cables out, get another one, plug it in, and you can be back up and running in a matter of minutes. So yes, it's a point of failure, but it is very quick and easy to go and fix that issue. Now if you look at the last one here, guys, mesh topology. This is not something you'll just see anywhere. These mesh topologies are generally only found in places where you need a very high level of redundancy and high availability. So you can probably only find these in server room environments, you know. So in a server room environment, you might see a mesh topology. Every device is connected to every other device. So if I have five devices, there we go. Each of these five devices would have a connection to every other device. So that has a lot of connections. So that's why that's the answer here. I mean, look here, I've just got five devices, but look at the amount of connections there, folks. It is crazy how many connections that is. So can you imagine for a moment I had more than just five devices? What if I had 20 or even 100 devices? Can you imagine how many connections that would be? Now, in case you guys didn't know, there's actually a formula you can go and use to work out how many connections there is. That's not really part of this specific question, but I just want to show you guys that there's actually a formula you can go and use. So there is the mesh topology formula. So what you guys are going to do is you're going to start off with this. There we go. That's what the formula looks like. And you're going to replace the letter N with the amount of devices you've got. So in my situation, I've got how many devices? Five. So I'm going to replace N with the number five. And it's, that's what it's going to look like. 
And there you can go. You can see now I'm working it out even further. And there you go. There's the answer. 10 cables. Now, if you look at the right-hand side, feel free to pause the video even if you want to at this point in time. You can go and count the amount of cables between those devices. And you're going to see you're going to end up at 10, just like my formula shows. So my formula got to the answer of 10. Go check on the right-hand side. You'll see it is 10 connections. So if you have a very big environment of lots of machines, of lots of connections, and you want to know how many connections there is or how many you're going to need to go and do this installation, this is a formula you can go and use to work out how many cables you're going to need. And that's obviously going to be able to, and that's obviously going to allow you to, you know, budget for it and plan for it and all that kinds of jazz. So once again, folks, the answer here is mesh topology. That's the one of the most connections when it comes to topologies. Moving on to question eight. You work for a company called Burning Ice Tech. The company is hosting a secure server on which all the connections are required to be encrypted. You've been tasked to harden the server. All the answer choices below are ports that are currently open on the server. Which of these ports should you close to ensure all connections are encrypted? Now you folks will notice I also said choose all that apply. So I don't want you guys to just give me one answer here. I want you to choose all the ports which are encrypted. That's what I need you to do. So the task here is to harden the server. Now, if you guys don't know what I mean by that, that's a term we use in IT when you need to make it more secure. So any ports that does not need to be open needs to be closed. Any services that does not need to run needs to be turned off. Anything that doesn't need to be installed needs to be uninstalled. That's generally what the term hardening a server means or hardening a firewall means. Now, in this instance, I just want you guys to make sure that all the ports we are using are encrypted and that we don't use ports that are not encrypted. So looking at the six ports that I've got for you guys here down below, I probably could have added more if I really wanted to, but looking at these six ports, which of those are encrypted? Now, if you look at answer A, that is SSH. That is indeed encrypted. If you look at B, that is Telnet. Now, Telnet and SSH is very much the same thing. It is to go and remote connect to something like a router. It's normally in a console view. You're probably going to go and use something like PuTTY, and you need to know the commands of this device that you're connecting to. Now, the difference between SSH and Telnet is Telnet is in clear text. I think I might have mentioned that already in this video. And SSH is encrypted. So A is already one of our answers. B is already one of the ones that I'm going to be ruling out. 25 is SMTP. So that's for the most part to send email, but it is in clear text. So C is also going to be rolled out. So C is also going to be one of the answers I'm going to rule out here. Answer D, port 80. That is for HTTP, Hypertext Transfer Protocol. That, folks, is normal clear text web browsing. So that is also one that I'm going to be ruling out. At the moment, the only correct answer that we have is 22. Looking at answer E, 443. That is for HTTPS, encrypted web browsing. So now we're getting somewhere. So we've got two answers, A and E. And F, folks, is 587 which is also encrypted email. So there we go. It's answer A, E, and F. So 22 is SSH, that is encrypted. 443, that is encrypted web browsing. And F, which is 587, that is encrypted email. There you go. Question nine. You are busy configuring a network at one of your customers. You need to ensure there are seven usable IP addresses. Which of the following would allow you to best meet this requirement? Now, folks, in the exam, you're going to be required to do a little bit of subnetting. Now, I'm going to try and summarize this as much as I possibly can for you guys. I want to make this as easy for you as I possibly can. But I do want to point out as well that the method I'm going to show you guys now that I'm going to get to my answer is not the only way. There's many ways you guys can go and do subnetting. You'll see if you go onto YouTube when you're on a search for subnetting, there is so many ways to get your answer. None of them are wrong. They all work. At the end of the day, with math, there's always more than one way to get your answer. So I very much encourage you guys to go and look for other methods to do subnetting as well and to look for one that works for you. Um, for some of you guys, you might love this method. And then for the next couple of guys, they might not like this method. So 
end of the day, this is just to show you guys how I got to the answer. And I am trying to simplify this for people that might not be very good with math. All right, so the question said, which of the following would allow you to best meet this requirement? So we need to go configure a network and we need to make sure there are seven usable IP addresses. Now, rule of thumb is we normally don't give more IPs than what is needed. And we also don't want to waste any IP addresses. Yep, that's an actual thing, folks. We do not want to waste IP addresses. So the less we've got to waste, the better. Now, looking at the available answers, there's about six that I've got for you guys there. Out of these six, five of them are real answers and one of them is fake. I threw a fake one in there just because I could. Why not? And out of the five real ones, only one of them is actually correct. All right, so what I'm going to do here for you folks is I'm going to bring up a table. There we go. So there is my table. And if you look at this table of mine, I'm going to draw some lines here just to make it a little bit more clear for you guys. If you look at this table, starting way at the bottom of the 22555.0 at the bottom left, that, folks, is a normal, normal class C network. If you see a network of 22555 in the front, the first three octets, that means you're dealing with class C. And if the last octet is a zero, you've got the full class C to yourself, all the available IP addresses. Now, a class C, folks, consists of 256 IP addresses. But in a network, you can normally not use the first IP address or the last one. They are reserved for network ID, broadcast address, that kinds of mumbo jumbo. Now, because there's always two IPs that's reserved in a network, I added minus two there to the 256 just to remind you guys that you cannot use all of that 256, but in reality, just 254. It's one network, as you guys can see, because you've got all of them to yourself, and the side of the notation is a slash 24. If you were to go up this table, instead of putting a zero at the back of that subnet mask, you can go put a 128. 128 would divide that 256 into two. So it's almost like a little pyramid theme kind of going on here, you know. So if you go and put a 128 at the back, you're splitting that 256 IPs into two, two networks of 128 IP addresses each. You can see there it is, 128 IP addresses each. And in each of those two networks, you cannot use the first IP or the last IP address. And you can see as we go up this table, you're going to have more and more networks. And uh, there's going to be less and less IP addresses available. I mean, if you look at the very top one, for instance, 64 networks, each of them containing four IP addresses, of which only two is usable. So you can count in fours 64 times and guess where you're going to end up at. 256 folks every time now looking at this table of mine we need to get seven usable ip addresses which one do you guys think that's going to be so if we look up this table starting at the bottom you can see that's 256 ip addresses actually it's just 254 if we go up and up and up and up eventually we'll end up at well, if you look at the second one from the top Eight IP addresses minus two. So that's just six IP addresses. That's not going to work. If you folks look at the third one from the top, 16 IPs of which 14 are usable. And out of that 14, we're only going to use seven. So there's, gonna, there's a waste of about seven IP addresses. But that's the least amount we can waste here. If I go up this table of mine, we're not going to have enough IP addresses. If you look at the second one from the top, there's only going to be six IP addresses. We're going to have a shortage of one. If you go even further up, we can have an even bigger shortage. And uh, if you look at anything below that 16 minus 2, you're going to have way too many IPs you're going to be wasting there. So um, what's going to meet our needs here best is going to be the 16 minus 2. In other words, 14 IP addresses will be wasting only 7 IP addresses. And what is the subnet mask associated with that? That, folks, will be a 22552.240. So we'll have 16 networks of 16 IPs each and on each of those networks of 16 IPs, we cannot use the first or the last one. The subnet mask is a 22552.240, and the side of the notation is a forward slash 28. Now, this is a table I came up with in 2010 when I was teaching Cisco. I was teaching CCNA and CCNP back in the day. And uh, at that point in time, it actually has eight columns. This one only has four columns. So the full table that I designed actually shows you bits borrowed and bits used and all of that. Not something I'm going to discuss right now at this moment but it actually does contain a lot more information than what we see here. So there's a bit of a table just to show you guys how I got to my answer. The subnet mask, folks, is going to be at 240. 
So if I take you guys back to the initial answers, there's all the answers. The answer is going to be the last one there, 240. The one that says triple two five five dot two forty. So the one that was fake here, in case anyone was wondering which one was the fake one, is answer D. There is no dot two hundred. There is no such answer, folks. If you folks would like to know more about subnetting, or if you want to see me going deeper into this topic, I do have videos on that on my channel. Uh, networking videos where I cover subnetting. So maybe just go check out the subnetting videos in my Network Plus series. All right, folks, let's move on to question 10. Now, before I reveal question 10, there's a bit of a game I like to play in some of my videos. If you guys have watched my other videos, you might know what game I'm talking about. There's sometimes a hidden word or a hidden phrase somewhere in the video. It could be anywhere in a video. And today, it's right here, right now. So the phrase for today is, it smells like Christmas. Now, besides dropping your normal comments in the comment section down below with your questions and all that, what you can do is you can play along. You don't have to. And you can go and type either the sentence, it smells like Christmas, or you can go and revamp it, rephrase it in some sort of way. Uh, you know, try and keep the word smell and the word Christmas, but keep it nice. You know, keep it clean. Keep to stick to YouTube's rules, of course. And see if you can rephrase it in some sort of clever, creative way. You know, and besides this being fun, it's going to confuse anyone that's just randomly scrolling through the comment section because they're going to wonder, why the heck are people talking about Christmas so much or smelling like Christmas? What the heck is going on? And only people that's watched the video up to this exact point would know what the heck is going on. So <laughs> if people start talking about Christmas, Christmas, Christmas in the comment section, then you'll know, okay? That's, that's someone that's actually watched the video up to this point because they know what it's all about. So if you would like to play with, you're welcome to. You don't have to. You can either type the phrase, it smells like Christmas, or it's beginning to smell like Christmas, or you can go and rephrase it in some clever, creative way, keeping to YouTube's rules, of course. So please don't go and swear. Keep it clean. Don't do anything. Don't say anything mean. Otherwise, the YouTube police are going to be on our case. All right, folks. So the phrase is, it's beginning to smell like Christmas. Now, moving on with the video. Question 10. You've been tasked to do a bit of a refresh of your wireless environment. As you start moving and placing access points, you notice there's a bit of an overlap with each other. Which of the channels can you select to avoid conflict with the channels overlapping? Now, what I mean by this question, guys, is I'm not sure if you guys have seen this. If you've got yourself multiple routers or multiple access points in a company environment, if they're close enough to one another and if they're on the same frequency, they sometimes do overlap a little bit and they interfere and influence on one another. That's not something we want. So if you happen to have a situation like that where you've got to put access points close to each other, close enough to the point where they start influencing one another, what we do in those situations is we put these access points on different channels. Think of it as a, a walkie-talkie. I'm not sure if you guys have ever seen that. So if you know what a walkie-talkie is, it's normally got two knobs in the top. One is for the volume, and the other one is to change between channels. Channel one all the way to five or six sometimes. And if you want to communicate with someone else on the walkie-talkie that's close by, you need to be on the same channel. Now, in this case, we don't want to be on the same channel. Now, if I have a bunch of access points close to one another, like in this specific scenario, yeah, they're influencing one another. They're interfering with one another. We need to put these access points on different channels. Three different channels. Now, all of these channels, except three of them, do still influence one another a little bit. But there's three specific channels that do not influence one another at all, like 0%. Those three specific channels, folks, is channel 1, channel 6, and channel 11. Please ensure you remember that for your exam. So obviously the questions in the exam are going to be phrased differently than mine because I literally sucked this out of my thumb. But there are multiple questions in the exam. Some of them are theory-based. Some of them are practical-based. There's going to be PBQs in the exam where you're going to be required to go and choose channels because of routers or access points or whatever influencing one another. And if you have that question in the exam, you need to remember that channel 1, channel 6, and channel 11 are the only ones that don't influence one another. If you go and choose any other free channels, they are still to a certain extent going to influence one another, and that's not what we want. The only way you can get around that is to choose specifically 1, 6, and 11. So if you've got three access points, you'll put the one access point on channel 1, the second one maybe on channel 6, and the third one on channel 11. All right, moving on. 
Question 11. You work for a company called Burning Ice Tech. You need to configure a server to dish out IP addresses to devices on the network. What role do you need to install and configure on the server to achieve this? Now, looking at the first answer there, guys, ADDS, that's Active Directory Domain Services. When you install that role on a server, it essentially installs the Active Directory software as we know it, which allows you or the IT administrator to create user accounts and groups and stuff like that, group policies. It's got nothing to do with IP addresses or dishing out IP addresses. Answer B, DHCP. That is a function that's built into most routers. It's turned on by default on most routers. And you can also go and install it on a server as a role. Its purpose is indeed to dish out IP addresses according to the range or the scope that the administrator has specified. So that is the answer here, folks. DNS, it's got so many names. Some people call this domain name server. Some people call it domain name servers. Uh, it's ugh, Guys, it's got so many names. But in a nutshell, its purpose is to convert IPs to names and names to IPs. We did briefly touch on this earlier in this video. So, no. You know where here do we mention websites, anything like that, where we have to go and do name resolution? None of that's mentioned here. So the answer remains B. D, Hyper-V. That is a feature you can go and turn on on a client operating system like Windows 10 or 11. It actually is available on Windows 8.1 as well. But it's only available on enterprise or professional editions of these operating systems I've mentioned. Now, it can be added as a role on a server, which is generally where we actually go and use this. And this role or feature's purpose is to allow you or the creator to run and create virtual machines. So this question mentions nothing about virtual machines. It's about dishing out IP addresses. And the only role or feature that achieves that is DHCP, folks. Question 12. You need to install a Nutic topology. Oh boy, maybe I should have moved this question way back in the question pool because we literally just a couple of questions ago spoke about topologies. Anyway, let's go. Let's push on through. We're here anyway now, so we might as well push on through. You need to install a Nutic topology that makes use of a central device with point-to-point -point connections to all other devices. Which of the following Nutic topologies should you go and install? If you guys paid attention to one of the previous questions where I had all the topologies, never mind me explaining it, I actually even showed it to you guys and you would remember what the answer is. So the only topology out of the four we've got in front of us guys that's got a central point is going to be the star topology. The bus topology, you guys would remember that's all in one row. Ring topology is in a ring. Star topology has got a central device which is usually going to be a switch. Obviously, it's not limited to a switch, but it's generally going to be a switch. That's the only real point of failure. And then the mesh topology, that's the one that's got so many connections where every device is connected to every other device. All right, folks, so the answer here is going to be a star topology. Question 13. Which of the following connector types are used by fiber optic cables? Choose all that apply. So I added as many connector types as I could possibly think of right here. I can actually think of another couple that I missed here. So which of these are fiber connector types? Now, I do want to point out that the fiber connectors I added here as answers are actually not all the fiber connectors you get. There's actually many fiber connectors, guys. Now, answer A, SC. Yes, that's a fiber connector, folks. Answer B, RJ11. No, that's not a fiber connector, guys. That is the connector that you would put on a phone cable, which is also known as a POTS cable, P-O-T-S, for plain old telephone system. And that cable is actually, ironically, also known as Category 3 cable. Good old-fashioned Cat 3. So no, that's for telephones. B and C, that is for coaxial cable, the old legacy cable, which nobody uses anymore. Uh, answer D, LC, yes, that is fiber, guys. Answer E, RJ45, probably one of the most common connectors on this list. That is for normal Cat5, Cat6, Cat7, and also on most Ethernet cables uses RJ45. So that's LAN cables. Let's just say LAN cables. So that's the cable you would generally go and connect to your laptop and desktop. And then the last one, folks, ST, or in other words, straight tip. That is also fiber. I'm not sure if any of you guys noticed, but all the fiber ones here had just two-letter abbreviations. 
And that's just a coincidence. There is other fiber connectors out there and they don't have two letter abbreviations. These are the only three that's got two letter abbreviations, but that's not the full name. The full name is actually much longer. I mean, for instance, if you look at answer F, which is ST, ST stands for straight tip. Moving on, question 14, folks. Which of the following is an example of an APIPA IP address? Ah, all right. So if you guys paid attention in my video about IP addresses, one of my previous videos, you would know what the answer is immediately if you see this list in front of us. So generally, if you see an IP address that starts with 10 dot something dot something dot something, that is a private IP address, but it's also a class A IP address. It's not set in stone. In real life, you can go and change that IP address to be a class B or a class C IP address, but by default, it's seen as a class A. Answer B, that is the answer. Answer B is an APIPA IP address. APIPA, folks, always starts with 169.254.something. So you can probably expect a couple of questions about this in the exam. It's both in the A plus exam as well as the Network plus exam. So they might say, which of the following is an example of APIPA? Pretty much like what I did here. Or they might throw it the other way around. They might give you an IP address that starts with 169.254. And they'll say, what kind of IP is this? And then from a list of names, you need to go and look for the name. It says APIPA. That's basically what it comes down to. Now, so we know the answer is answer B here. Answer C is a loopback IP address. That is used to test your own TCP IP stack or, you know, to test your own network card. So if you suspect there's a fault with your own network card, this can be used to check if your own network card on your own machine is faulty in some sort of way. Answer D is a private IP address, but it's a class C IP address. Any IP address that starts with 192.168.0, by default, this is seen as class C, unless you manually go and change the subnet mask. And um, one of the ones that I don't see here is class B. So if you see an IP address that starts with 172.16. something. something that's also private, but it's seen as class B by default until you go and manually change it, of course. All right, so the answer is B, folks. Question 15. You've been hired at Burning Ice Tech to assign two IP addresses to WAN interfaces on connected routers. In order to conserve IP address space, which of the following subnet masks should you use for this subnet? So you'll notice here I've only displayed the CIDR notations. Now, in real life, they might sometimes just give you the side notation like I'm doing now, or they'll give you an IP address, and then literally on the IP address, behind the last couple of digits, you'll see a forward slash and a number which could possibly be one of these. Now, if you see an IP address with a side notation, that actually tells you a lot. It tells you what your subnet mask is, tells you how many networks you've got, how many IP addresses you've got, but then you need to be familiar with subnetting to know what that number means. I mean, other people can, of course, go and work it out, but you actually eventually get to a point in time in your IT career where you just look at the number and you already know how many IPs that is. You already know how many networks that is. All right, so we need to conserve IP addresses like usual, and we need to assign only two IP addresses. So we're looking for a network that has only two IP addresses or as close as possible to only two IP addresses. So like before, when we did a little bit of a subnetting question, here is my table. And if you look at the second column from the left, available IPs. Now we can already see the very first one at the top, the one that says 22552.252, that subnet mask there, has four IPs of which only two are usable. So that's going to be the one we want here, folks. So what is the side of notation associated with that subnet mask? It is a forward slash 30. Now if we go back to our list of answers here, which one is the answer? forward slash 30. The regarding that little table I just showed you guys, think of that as your cheat sheet. It's not really cheating, it's actually totally allowed. What you can go and do in your N plus exam, and this is allowed guys, with all your exams, A plus, N plus, all of these exams, when you're about to start your exam, they give you roughly an A4 sized whiteboard, usually of a, a whiteboard marker. And you are allowed to go and work out things, make notes of things, you can use it for whatever. But at the end of the exam, it will get confiscated from you. You're not allowed to go and take it out of the exam. So don't bother writing down questions so that you can go and show it to your friends and that kind of stuff. It's not allowed and they're going to confiscate it from you. So don't even bother doing that. But what you can go and do is you can use that whiteboard to work out the answer to stuff. So if you need to go and do some sort of mathematical formula, yes, you can go and do that. 
What you can also go and do is you can go and write out this table of mine. So this little table I've got on the screen or that I had on a screen earlier, you can go write it on the whiteboard when you start your exam. And whenever you get a subnetting related question, you just look at that little table of mine and you're going to literally see the answer. Instead of spending two minutes, five minutes, 10 minutes or more working out what the answer could be, you could literally look at a table of yours that you just drew on the whiteboard and you'll see the answer within a matter of one second. And you can just move on to the next question and move on to the next question. Every time you get some sort of subnetting related question, you look down at the table, within one second you'll see the answer and you just move on to the next question. It's not cheating, it's totally allowed, folks. Classic case of why work harder when you can work smarter, right? Now moving on to question 16, folks. You've been asked to go to a company called Burning Ice Tech where a NIC, that's Network Interface Card, where a NIC has recently been installed. You need to troubleshoot the NIC. You decide to ping the loopback address. Which of the following is a loopback address? There's only one, folks. There's not multiple loopback addresses. There's only one loopback address. And I literally gave you folks the answer to that a couple of questions ago. So if you paid attention to the one we had a couple of questions ago where I explained different kinds of IPs, you would know what the answer is already. So answer A, 10 dot something, something, something. That is private and it's class A by default. Could be a something else, but it's seen as class A by default. Answer B is in fact the answer. That's the only loopback address that exists unless you go and ping your own IP address, but that's, that's the only loopback address here, folks. Answer C is a public IP address. So if you folks watched my networking videos, specifically the ones that's about IP address types, you would remember that I said any IP address that you do not recognize in the list of answers in the exam is either a fake IP address or a public IP address. It's most likely a public IP address. Now, answer C is not something we're going to recognize, which means it's a public IP address, one that you or someone would use when you go online on the internet. Answer D is an APIPA IP address because it starts with 169 or 254. Any IP address that starts with 169 or 254 is always going to be a APIPA. It's not really an IP address. It's what you get if you are unable to get an IP address. So if a device has been configured on dynamic, which is the default, and it's trying to get an IP address from the DHCP, and it's unable to get one for whatever reason, you will have an APIPA IP address. Answer E, 172.16 something something. That I mentioned a couple of questions ago. It was not listed as an answer, but I did explain it to you guys as an extra. So that's a private IP address, but it's a class B by default. And then the last one there, guys, F. It's a private IP address, but it's seen as class C by default. Question 17. You've been tasked to do something called network segmentation. Which of the following benefits will it provide? Alrighty. Answer A, link aggregation. Now, that is something we discussed way in the beginning of this video. I think it was like question two or question three somewhere. Link aggregation, guys, is when you take multiple cables between two switches, for example, and you combine them together as if they are one. So this is also known as port aggregation. It's also known as NIC teaming. So if I've got two switches and I want to make sure they're a little bit faster, but also that we've got a little redundancy between them, I can go and do something called link aggregation. So it's two links between the two switches and they serve the exact same purpose. So that's got nothing to do with network segmentation, which is what the question requires. So answer A is out. Answer B, load balancing. Now load balancing is a little bit similar to answer A. It's not exactly the same, but it's close. So load balancing could, for example, be two network cards. You've got a server that happens to have two network cards and you connected them both to the same network. So it's very close to link aggregation if you think about it. I'm balancing the load, but it also gives you fault tolerance. I can have two identical servers that serve the exact same purpose, and they're both connected to the same network at the same time. That is also load balancing. But it's got nothing to do with segmenting your network. Answer C, security through isolation. Now that, folks, is indeed the answer here. We'll get to that in just a second. And answer D, network analytics. That's just to show you the analytics of your network, you know. Um, is it on? Is it off? How long has it been on? How much data have you pushed? How many people on the network? And, and, and. So that's not going to do anything called network segmentation. So segmentation is to basically divide your network into small little sections. Think of this as a ship. If you folks ever saw a huge ship on the ocean, 
you would know that it's got multiple compartments, many, many, many compartments. And each of these compartments have got these huge fixed steel doors which are waterproof. So in the unfortunate event where one of these compartments is possibly flooding, maybe there's a hole on the side of the ship or something, maybe it hit an iceberg or whatever, you know, kind of like the Titanic. All they do is they just seal that compartment. They seal the two doors on both sides of the compartment and that compartment is going to flood, but the water is not going to be able to leak out of that compartment to any of the other compartments. That's called segmentation. So you're containing the damage in one segment of that ship. Now, network segmentation, folks, is the same thing. You still have your big network as a, as a whole, just like that ship we spoke of, except that ship has got many, many little compartments, and if you combine them all together, that gives you your big ship as a whole. The network is no different. It consists of many, 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 many little subdivisions, if you want to call it that, but the whole thing together makes your whole network as a whole. Now, why do we do that? Because it's isolation. So in the event of someone managing to get into my my network, a hacker of sorts, he or she is potentially going to be limited to that small segment of my network. They can't get out of it, or at least hopefully they won't be able to get out of it. So we're not going to stop them. We just want to limit what they can see and do. It's a form of damage control, if you want to call it that. Question 18. You have been tasked to help a company called Burning Ice Tech ensure long-term health in the event of a disaster. Which of the following concepts are most important to help ensure long-term health? Now, I want you guys to give me two answers here, which is why I wrote there two. So I've given you guys five possible answers to choose from. So we want to ensure long-term health. And looking at answer A, vulnerability scanning. When I couldn't completely rule that out, but that's not the answer I'm looking for right now. So that's just to look for weaknesses in your company environment. And obviously, if you can rule it out, then... In the long term, I suppose we could go and argue and say that could give you health, but it's not the answer I'm really looking for today. Answer B, off-site backups. So far, that looks like one of the answers, and it actually is one of the answers I'm looking for, but we'll get to that in just a moment. Answer C, making use of acceptable use policy. Now, what you will find in a lot of companies is when you start a company laptop or desktop up, right as you're about to put in your Windows password, there's a policy on the screen, a set of rules, if you will, that you've got to agree to first before you can log in. Now that, folks, is an acceptable usage policy. It basically specifies what you're allowed to do and what you're not allowed to do of that company asset. So if you're going to go and use that company laptop or desktop for something that's not allowed, let's say go YouTubing and Facebooking and use it for all kinds of personal stuff, then you are in violation of that acceptable usage policy sometimes. The same can be applied to websites and stuff like that. So sometimes when you're about to go and use something, they might force you to agree to some sort of AUP first, that's the acceptable usage policy, and only after you agree to it will they allow you to use this platform or this tool or this device. So companies love using this on their company assets because they want to force their employees to only use it for work purposes. Now that's got nothing to do with long-term health though, so the answer is definitely not C. D, making use of UPS, uninterruptible power supply. So that's a form of backup power. And you'll find a lot of these UPSs can provide you with clean energy. So if the voltage goes up or it goes down, it'll keep it consistent. And it also has a built-in surge protector. But none of this has got anything to do with your long-term health. It'll only help you in the event of one emergency where a lightning strike maybe strikes the building. So it's not going to help you with long-term health. E, redundancy. Yes. So the answers I'm looking for here, folks, is B and E. So off-site backups will help you recover in the event of a disaster. Remember the question said, in the event of a disaster. So in the event of a disaster, off-site backups will help you. Not just any backups, off-site backups. Remember it said disaster. So if the building burns down, that could be disaster. Maybe there's a mudslide, a tsunami, a massive robbery, the building blows up for all we know. That is all disasters. So in that event, you can go and resort to using your offsite backups and at least you'd have your, your data. Now, redundancy is very much the same thing as a backup. That basically forms part of your redundancy. So redundancy would be to maybe have a backup site. So instead of having all your servers at one site, in other words, all your eggs in one basket, you've got a backup site with clone servers. That would be an example of redundancy. So in the event of a disaster, you just fall over to your second site, and the users that needs to access your servers remotely, they are none the wiser. They don't even know your one site is down. 
A lot of big companies works like that, folks. So the answer here is B and E. Question 19. You have been hired at Burning Ice Tech as a technician. Welcome, guys. Your first task is to prevent outside users from being able to tell net into any of the servers in a data center. Which of the following ports should you block? So I don't want anybody to be able to tell net into my company's servers. I need you guys to go and block a port, a very specific port. So the port I needed to block is specifically the port for Telnet. So this question is actually very huge, but if I really wanted to, I could have just asked you, which port is Telnet? That's it. I could have literally just said that, but where's the fun in that? We know in the exam, it's normally not going to be that short. They like to go and stretch things out. And that's what I'm trying to simulate here. I'm trying to get you guys ready for the exam. I'm trying to get you guys used to how they will phrase this and all that kinds of jazz. But in a nutshell, I just need you guys to tell me out of this list of ports down below, which one is Telnet? Because that's the one I need you to close. So port 22. Can anyone remember what that was? We already discussed that earlier in this video. That is SSH, Secure Shell. 23 is Telnet. So that's the answer. 25 is SMTP. So that's the old school way of sending email. 53 is DNS. So that's converting IPs to names and names to IPs. 80 is HTTP. So that's clear text web browsing. 110 is pop free, so that's basically receiving email, or at least the old way of doing it. 443 is HTTPS, that is encrypted web browsing. And the last one I've got there, 3389, is RDP, which is Remote Desktop Protocol. That's to remotely connect to another machine, but you can do it in a graphical interface. So the answer here, folks, remains 23. Question 20. Which of the following attacks encrypts user data and requires a proper backup implementation to be able to recover. All right, so looking at the four answers here, folks, and I did accidentally mention this answer once or twice in this video already, way in the beginning, if you guys paid attention. So which one of these four encrypts your data or a user's data? And this is not by choice. This is against your will. Is it answer A, a DDoS? DDoS is a distributed denial of service attack. So we have mentioned DOS, you know, just normal DOS. That is a denial of service attack. But DDoS is distributed. That's a much larger scale. So that's generally when you go and overload a website of so much freaking traffic or a server to the point where it times out or crashes, rendering it useless for the people that's trying to access their service or this website. So that's got nothing to do with encryption. So it's not A. B, ransomware. Yes, that's the answer, folks. Ransomware is malware which will either encrypt your machine or the user's machine or the whole company's machines, all of them. Encrypts the data. You can have to pay a ransom in most cases in the form of cryptocurrency to get the recovery software, and then you can go and unencrypt your data. Or at least that's what they like you to believe. Sometimes you get it, sometimes you don't get it. You're taking a leap of faith. So the answer is B, Cedar Mac spoofing. So earlier in this video, we did briefly mention what spoofing is. Spoofing is to pretend to be something you're not. I'm faking my IP address. I'm faking my MAC address, which is what they're referring to in this instance of answer C. Or I can fake my email address or whatever. Now, MAC spoofing is to just fake my hardware address so I can go get past MAC filters and basically frame you or someone for some sort of shenanigans that I'm getting up to. But it's got nothing to do with encryption, folks. Fishing, and yes, you spell it like that on purpose. We're not fishing for fish in a river or an ocean or a dam or something like that. Fishing is to fish for information, something sensitive, something of value. Now you get subcategories of phishing. So phishing on its own predominantly refers to emails, but it's not limited to emails. So I can send you an email right now pretending to be your bank. And I'm going to say, hey, listen, bro, I need your username and I need your password. And since I'm pretending to be the bank, you might be inclined to give it to me. Now, on its own, you might not necessarily fall victim to that because you're probably going to see it's going to come from some weird email address, not your bank's email address. So if it comes from at gmail.com, then you might be like, hang on a moment. Why is my bank mailing me from a Gmail address? That looks very funky and suspicious. So phishing is usually combined with other forms of attack like spoofing. And I did mention this earlier, spoofing as well. Spoofing is usually combined with other forms of attacks as well. So if I go and send you an email pretending to be your bank, that on its own is phishing. But at the same time, if I make the email look like it's coming from your bank, if you look at the email address that it's coming from, it looks just like the bank's email address. That is spoofing. 
So I'm combining spoofing with phishing, and that's normally when it becomes very dangerous because even people that's experienced might fall victim to this now. So guys, the answer is not phishing here because phishing, as you can see or hear, it's got nothing to do with encryption. The answer is and remains B. Question 21. You have been asked to come into a company called Burning Ice Tech. The company wants you to analyze attacks directed towards the company's network. Which of the following must you implement to assist with this request? All right, folks. So I need you to analyze attacks that's directed to the company's network. Now, how do you think you're going to be able to achieve that? Looking at the answers down below. Is it A, a honeypot? Well, that is very possible. And that actually is the answer, folks. A honeypot is kind of like a distraction. You know, you're trying to get attackers or hackers to go for the honeypot. They are going to think this is the real thing. So uh, for all intents and purposes, these hackers think they're attacking your real network or your real server. Meanwhile, it's a fake. It's a distraction. And while they're busy of the fake one, you get to analyze who this is, how they're getting in, what they might potentially be after. And um, that obviously allows you to gather more information, which allows you to protect the real thing in the background. So by the time they realize, oh, shucks, this is not the real thing, then it's too late because you've already implemented the necessary security measures on the real thing. Now, network segmentation is something we have discussed previously in this video. So that's a form of isolation where you subdivide your network so that they are kind of sort of trapped in one part of the network. So that is a very good security measure. But the question that I gave you guys specifically wants you to analyze attacks. And network segmentation is not going to allow you to do that. We want to analyze. We want to redirect them. So to do that, we need to trick them to go to another place, which is the honeypot. And while they're busy there, we get to analyze what they're up to. A man trap, also a good form of security. And believe it or not, man traps are actually not just limited to IT. So these supposedly are found in some server rooms, but I've never really seen them in server rooms in my area, but I suppose it does vary from country to country. So where you guys might see this is at some jewelry stores or potentially at a bank, depending once again on your country. So normally you've got to go into a glass box of some kind and you've got to wait for some light to turn green. And once the light turns green while you're in the box, then you can enter the, the jewelry store or the bank, or whatever this is. And the same applies when you want to exit this building. So now if they see you coming in and you look like um, you're up to some sort of shenanigans, like you might try and rob them, they can actually trap you in this box. And it's normally a bulletproof box. So even if you're going to try to shoot your way out, it's not going to work. And the same applies when you just rob this facility. If you rob them, you've got to go through that door to get out. And <laughs> as soon as you go through that door to get out, guess what? You're going to get stuck in that, that, uh, that little compartment. So apparently these man traps, you do get them in server rooms as well. Very rare, but if someone is up to something, they're going to get trapped in that man trap. The last one there, folks, antivirus. Also a form of security. So all four of these answers I've given you are forms of security. So I on purposely keep them that close. You know, I on purposely keep them in the same category to make this as difficult for you to determine what the answer is. You know, the whole idea is, is for me to test you guys on this. So antivirus does analyze stuff, but it's more to check if stuff is malicious, not what you're up to. So that's going to be more for codes and stuff. So it's going to analyze programs and stuff. It's not going to analyze traffic. We want to analyze traffic coming from actual human beings. People that's up to some sort of shenanigans. Antivirus doesn't really do that. Antivirus just monitors the behavior of your programs on your machines. So it's not an antivirus, folks. The answer remains A, a honeypot. Question 22. You have been asked by Burning Ice Tech to come in to assist a user who is having connectivity issues. After investigation, you notice the user brought their own personal wired router. The user claims to use it to be able to use multiple computers and connect them to the network. So basically, this user is trying to use their home router as if it is a switch, because you can do that. Generally, we use a router to serve the purpose of, well, a router, to route your traffic across the internet and to give you access to the internet. But if you know how to, you can actually go and use a router to act like a switch. I mean, it's not going to have a lot of ports by default, but you can do that. Now, this person brought their own router from home with the intention of using it like a switch at the office so they can connect more devices at the office. But now this person is moaning and groaning that they don't have connectivity. There's some sort of issue. So which of the following has this user 
most likely brought into the network besides a router. I mean, we know they brought a router. So did they bring in spyware? No, guys. A router is not spyware. Its purpose is to route traffic. So spyware is generally some sort of software that's going to be running in the background on people's machines, and it or they are going to try and capture sensitive information. There's, there's absolutely no mention here of spyware. The user has got connectivity issues. Spyware has got absolutely nothing to do with connectivity issues. A honeypot, we know what that is due to the previous questions. We had like a one or two questions ago. That is to distract hackers or attackers to get them to attack that server or service first. It's a fake one. And it allows you to investigate what they're up to, how they're trying to get in, what they might be after. And then you can obviously go and implement the necessary mitigations to kind of stop them. So it's not B. C, evil twin. Evil twin is when some sort of perpetrator goes and gets themselves their own router or access point and they go and try and trick users into connecting to their router or access point instead of the real thing. Usually it's going to be a router. So I might have a router in my company, and now some evil person comes into my company, they bring their own little router, and they give the SSID the exact same name. If you don't remember what the SSID is, that's the name of the Wi-Fi. So maybe the, the Wi-Fi in my building is called Burning Ice Tech Wi-Fi, and this perpetrator brings in their own little router, and they also call their little Wi-Fi burning ice tech Wi-Fi. And they make the password blank or something like that. In the hopes of tricking people to connect on their little Wi-Fi. And as soon as they do that, they're going to be able to capture usernames and passwords and stuff from those people's machines. Now that's not what this one is about. This one says they just don't have connectivity. So the answer is most likely going to be a rogue DHCP server. I'm not saying it's not possible that it's an evil twin. It's possible when I wrote these questions. So realistically, the more likely answer here is it's a rogue DHCP. I've, I've never seen an evil twin, guys. It's, I've been in IT for 20 years, and I've never seen this. I'm not saying it doesn't happen. I'm sure it does happen in some companies in some places in the world. But it's so freaking rare. The chance of that happening is 0,0001% or something. You're, you're never going to see that. So it is possible. If your users do connect to the wrong router... And this perpetrator is trying to get usernames and passwords from the machine. Yes, they will temporarily have no connectivity. And that can temporarily cause the issue they're experiencing here. But the more likely answer here is a rogue DHCP server. Most routers, if not all, have DHCP on them. And it's usually turned on by default. So what that router is most likely doing now, the one that they brought from home, it's probably dishing out IP addresses. But it's dishing it out on the wrong network on the wrong range and everything is just wrong. So your devices, or at least the ones from that user, they need to receive IP addresses from the real DHCP in that specific environment, not the DHCP on their own router. That router is dishing out the wrong IP addresses, which is why these devices don't have connectivity. They have an IP, but it's the wrong IP, most likely in the wrong range. So they need to get one from the real DHCP. So we call that a rogue DHCP server. Question 23. You have been asked by Burning Ice Tech to prevent unauthorized hosts from connecting to the network via Ethernet. So that's network cables. You need to implement an access control at layer 2. Which of the following should you implement? Now layer 2 of the OSI model, for those of you not familiar with the OSI model, is also referred to as the switching layer. So this is most likely going to be something that you're going to be doing on the what? The switch. Now, I want two answers from you guys, which is why I wrote two there. I'm going to make this quite interesting for you guys. So which one of these four answers, or which two of these four answers, is something you can go and do on a switch? And it allows me to go and implement some form of control on my network. Is it A, access control lists? Yes, that's the first answer, folks. Access control lists is usually something you'll do on a switch. This is normally done on a managed switch, not an unmanaged switch. So on managed switches, these normally cost way more money, but they do allow you to log into them and they come with many, many functionalities and features. One of which is access control lists. Now, we did mention this earlier in this video, so that's to allow you as the administrator to control the flow of traffic in your environment. So depending on where the user is coming from and where they want to go, that'll determine whether the access list is going to allow them or not. So you get to specify where people can go to and where they're allowed to come from if they want to access a resource. So, yes, that's one of the answers. A captive portal. That is a form of security on a network, but that is a wireless form of security. So, the question specifically said 
people are connecting via what? Ethernet. So that's wired communications. And captive portal is wireless communication. It's not going to work. Now, captive portal is something you will see if you go and connect on a Wi-Fi or a hotspot, usually in a public place. So if you go to a coffee shop and you want to jump on their free Wi-Fi, well, at least they normally say it's free, but as soon as you try and connect to it, you'll see it's going to ask you for a password or a voucher of some kind. And normally this is because this coffee shop wants you to go and buy a cup of coffee or something first before they'll allow you to jump on their free Wi-Fi. That little portal you're going to see first before you're allowed to jump onto their Wi-Fi. That's a captive portal, folks. But it's something you'll see on a wireless network. Answer C, WPA. That is also a form of security. All four of these are security because I like to do that. I like to keep the answers close to one another. But WPA is a form of wireless security again. B and C is both forms of wireless security. WPA is a form of wireless encryption security. So that's something you'll go and put on a wireless network, a form of encryption, if you will. So the answers here obviously is going to be A and D. I haven't even explained D yet, but since we need to go and choose two, you already know the answer is going to be D as well. Port security, folks, is also something you can go and do on a switch. So also, once again, on a managed switch, not the cheap switches. So port security will allow you to go and choose what happens if someone unplugs a cable at a switch and they try to plug something else into that port. So this could be an unauthorized user, and now they want to try and connect to your company's network because they want to get up to some sort of nonsense. And as soon as they unplug one of your cables and they plug something else in, that switch can do something about it automatically. It can either just send a notification or an alert to the administrators and do nothing about it, or it can, for example, shut down that port. So the port was working fine, They've unplugged the cable, still working fine, it's just nothing is plugged into it. And as soon as they plug something else into that port, something which was not the original cable, the port automatically immediately shuts down, and 10 to 1, it's going to send an alert to your administrators in the background, which is you. It's going to say, hey, listen, someone just plugged something into port 5 on switch 7, please go check it out now. And there's a very good chance you might even catch this person red-handed in that office with the cable still in their hands. Wouldn't that be funny? Question 24. You have a client that plans on installing the following configuration at their company. All right, folks, I've got a bit of a table for you guys here. I thumb sucked it. So you'll see there in a the table, I've got PCA, which is going to connect to switch one. And that's over a distance of 130 meters. And if you need to work in feet or if you guys prefer to work in feet, I added that there for you guys as well. The cable type I'm going to be using is CAT5. And it's a straight through cable. So the connectors looks the same on both sides. And then I've got switch one and switch two, which is connected to one another. That's over a distance of two meters. There I used CAT6. It's a crossover cable, so the connectors are not the same on both sides. So crossover, for those of you that don't remember, that was discussed in question one in this video. Pin one and pin two, which are senders, will go to pin three and six, which are receivers. That's a crossover cable. And we've got switch two, which is going to go to PCB there, over a distance of 5 meters, and that's going to be a CAT5 cable, which is straight through. Alright, so you need to inform the client here, guys, if you see potential issues with their plans, which the following will be an issue. So let's imagine I am this client. You need to tell me what's wrong with this picture here. So here's the possible answers, guys. Looking at these cables, the distances, the types, and all that, do you see something wrong with this picture? Is there going to be interference? No, guys. Nowhere in my question did I mention anything regarding EMI, heavy machinery, fluorescent lights, power cables. Nowhere do I mention anything regarding that in this question. It's not going to be EMI. It's not going to be RFI. There's no interference here. Is it answer B? Attenuation. I can't even pronounce that. I'm probably going to butcher that. So I apologize. I'm not English. I've said it before. My first language is not English, but I try very hard. So that basically means the distance, the maximum distance a cable can go. After a certain amount of distance, some cables, they lose their, how can I put this? Their signal strength. They can only go up to a maximum distance. And after a certain distance, you will have to repeat the signal of that cable. Otherwise, it's just not going to work. Now, for those of you that's got A plus manuals, or if you went and studied, you would know the maximum distance for a CAT5 as well as a CAT6 cable is 100 meters. 
Now, I'm not 100% sure how much that is in feet. I think it's about 320 something feet. I'll have to go and type it into Google. So it's 100 meters if you're using the metric system. After which, you will have to repeat that signal. So you're going to have to put that cable into a switch or a repeater or some sort of device, and then you can go and extend it with another 100 meters cables or so according to the manuals and according to the A plus course. Now, in real life, folks, funny enough, you will never get 100 meters. Realistically, in real life, you'll get about 80 or 90 meters. But that's the difference between book knowledge, or should I say theory knowledge, and real life. According to CompTIA and according to A+, the maximum distance a cable can go is 100 meters, but I guarantee you, you will not get 100 meters in one go in real life. That's the difference between theory and real life. Now, keeping that in mind, remember CompTIA says the maximum distance a Cat5 and Cat6 cable can go is 100 meters. If you look at those three cables there, guys, is one of them longer than 100 meters? Yes, the first one is 130 meters. So according to CompTIA, it can only go 100. So it's 50 meters too long. In real life, it's actually 40 or 50 meters too long because in real life, it can only go up to 80 or 90 meters. So the answer here is in fact B. Now C, humidity will not have any influence on network cables, guys. Network cables are not influenced by humidity whatsoever. They are, however, sometimes influenced by distance, which is the case here. And they are sometimes influenced by EMI or RFI, which is basically the same thing. You'll see there, answer D, using switches instead of repeaters. It doesn't matter, guys. So you could go use a repeater. A repeater, its purpose is literally just to go and extend a cable. So if your cable is, let's say, 90 meters long already, and you want to get it to go more than 100 meters, you can go and use a repeater, and its purpose is literally just to go and extend the length of your cable. That's the purpose of a repeater, hence the name. But most companies will not use repeaters. It's unnecessarily. So what they will normally do is they'll use switches because all over the company, the switches. So if a network cable is, let's say, near 100 meters, they'll plug it into a switch. And from that switch, it's going to go to another switch and to another switch. Every time it goes into a switch, it actually boosts the signal again, believe it or not. Question 25. With all forms of public cloud, you relinquish some control. With which of the following cloud service models do you have the least amount of control? All right, folks, so first of all, for those of you that don't know, you actually get different types of cloud. You get private cloud, you get hybrid cloud, and you get public cloud. Now, within public cloud, you get different deployment models. Let's call these deployment service models. Now, you get, for example, oh, I almost gave away the answer there for a moment. <laughs> I had to focus there for a bit. All right, so let's just leave it there for now. Uh, with these different types of public cloud, you're definitely going to be relinquishing some level of control because it's all somewhere else on someone else's property. The question here is, how much control do you still have? Now, the question here that I've got for you guys is, I want to know which one of these do you have the least amount of control? Now, if you look at answer A, IAAS, that is short for Infrastructure as a Service. Now, that one, you actually have the most amount of control. An example of infrastructure as a service would be virtual machines in the cloud. So if you, for example, have a virtual machine on your laptop or your desktop or even your company server, that would just be an example of infrastructure, just normal infrastructure. But if you go and take that virtual machine and you upload its virtual hard drive to the cloud or you go and create it from scratch in a cloud, that would now be an example of infrastructure as a service. It's now occupying the cloud provider's hard drive space. It's using their system memory or RAM, and it's using their CPU cycles and all that. But other than that, you've got, for the most part, full control. You might not be able to see the actual data center or service. You can't see them or touch them. You can't see or touch the actual network cables in the background. But other than that, you've got control, guys. You can choose exactly how much RAM this virtual machine needs to have, um, how big the hard drive needs to be, how fast it needs to be, how many you want, how fast your CPU needs to be, how many CPUs you want. You've got full control, guys. You can even choose the exact operating system. And when you eventually log on to this machine remotely, you've got full, full control. So infrastructure as a service is the public cloud form where you've got the most amount of control. Then answer B, platform as a service, is the second one where you've got the second most control. So an example of platform as a service would be something like Active Directory, specifically Active Directory in the cloud, like Microsoft's Azure Active Directory, which they've now renamed to Entra ID. 
So if you've got your normal Active Directory on-premises, it's just that. It's just an Active Directory on-premises. But if you've got it on a platform like Microsoft's Azure platform, that would be an example of platform as a service. So if you look at something like a normal Active Directory on-premises, it requires a lot of work. I wouldn't say it's rocket science, but it takes a lot of work and a lot of time to get it up and running. You would have to build yourself a physical or a virtual server. You would need to install the server operating system. You would need to go and add a role called the ADDS role. You would need to go and promote this domain controller and eventually you'll get to a point where you can go and create user accounts and groups and all that mumbo jumbo. Not rocket science, but what it is, is it's going to take a lot of time. And if you look at the cloud Active Directory that Microsoft Azure provides, they've done most of the work for you. And we just get to swoop in in the last minute and reap the benefits. So the cloud provider literally goes and looks at things that we don't want to do and that we don't have time to do, and they will go and do it for us and sell this back to us as a solution. Active Directory being one such example. All you need to do is just go and create user accounts and groups, and that's about it. So that's platform as a service, folks. The third one there, software as a service, is when you've got software or applications that would normally be installed and running on your machine, but now it's installed and running on the cloud provider's platform. Uh, a good example would once again be Microsoft. So this application or program is now installed on their platform. It's running on their platform and it literally just displays to you or the user via the internet, probably via something like a browser. So it gets you around compatibility issues. Um, you can literally have a machine that's like 100 years old. As long as you've got a decent screen and a decent internet connection, you can run pretty much any application. So that's the one where you've got the least amount of control, which is actually the answer here. And if you're wondering what the last one there is, QAAS, I completely made that up, guys. That doesn't even exist. I literally sucked that out of my thumb. It doesn't exist. It's fake. It's not a matter of, oh, maybe it's this. Maybe No, I made that up. I literally made it up. I needed to fill the gap somehow. <laughs> I had three answers. And as I was typing this out, I was like, okay, what am I going to put there, which is going to throw you guys off your game? Because normally the other answer choices that I put in there needs to be as close as possible um, to the real thing and I ran out of ideas there so I, now that I think about it I could have probably actually put in there is other forms I could have gone and put in D in there D-A-A-S because that actually is a thing so I should have actually just put that in there but I put in Q because I couldn't think of something in that moment and it was late I was tired you know so I made that up D doesn't exist question 26 you work in the IT department of a company called Burning Ice Tech how's that for self promo <laughs> one of your users calls the IT department to report being unable to log in after locking the computer the user resets the password but later in the day the user is again unable to log in after locking the computer which of the following attacks against this user is taking place is it ransomware? No, guys. Ransomware is the type of attack, but it's usually automated for the most part, and it usually encrypts. Nowhere in this question do I mention anything about encrypting. So ransomware is going to encrypt the user's machine, all their data, or a whole freaking company, all their machines, and all their servers. There's absolutely no mention here of encryption. There's no mention of a ransom having to be paid. It's not A. Now, looking at answer B de authentication now guys that's generally a denial of service attack or a sort of denial of service attack dos for short generally you'll see this taking place on a wireless connection it's not limited to that but that's generally where you'll see that so if someone tries to log in wirelessly on a network it's just not going to work so they basically prevent people from logging in wirelessly now in this specific question that's not 100% related the user was able to log in with their past and all that they were not denied it's just after a while, it will stop working. They've got to go and change their password again, and then it'll work again. So a denial of service attack, that's not the symptoms of a denial of service attack, or should I say, de-authentication attack. On C, brute force attack. So far, yes, that's the answer, guys. Brute force is a type of password attack. You get many kinds. You get brute force. You get a rainbow table attack. You get a dictionary attack, just to name a few. Now, brute force attack is when someone or something tries to guess your password or someone's password. So normally it's going to be something and not someone, you know, unless I know you very well. If I know you very well, then I can go and do a couple of guesses of what I think your password might be. But if you go look at a random person's account or a random platform's account, 
Um, the chances of me guessing the past is very unlikely as a human being. So I'm going to need a little help. I'm going to need some software that's going to try all kinds of passwords with very powerful computing power in the background. So that's a brute force attack. It's going to try all kinds of passwords until it eventually guesses your passwords and then it can potentially lock you out. So that's normally what it's going to do. So if I use a brute force attack on your account, eventually when it cracks the password, never mind me gaining access, I can actually potentially go and change the password then and lock you out, which is most likely what's happening in this scenario here. Someone is using a brute force attack on this person's account. So they change the password, then they've got access again. And then until this brute force attack cracks the password again, and then they go and change the password, locking the user out. And then the user has to go and reset their password again, and then they gain access again. So, yeah. Answer D, obviously we know that's not the answer. A phishing attack is something we have discussed in this video before. So that's when I am phishing for something sensitive, something of value. I'm most likely going to send you an email, and I'm most likely going to combine this with other forms of attacks like a spoofing attack. I'm most likely going to pretend to be some entity like your bank or some well-known entity that you know and trust. And I'm going to ask you for something sensitive, something of value, like your personal name and last name, your ID number, your social security number, your passport number, your usernames and passwords, anything of value really. So phishing attacks are not limited to email, but it's predominantly going to be email. All right, folks, the answer stays and remains C. Question 27. You work in the IT department of a company called Burning Ice Tech. There I go with my self-promo again. <laughs> One of the users in the company complains about poor quality with video conferencing. After investigation, you find that other users are using excessive bandwidth. Which of the following would best improve performance? So what's happening in this pretend company of mine is I've got a bunch of employees that's abusing the internet. They are abusing the bandwidth. So these guys are on YouTube or they're on some other websites. They're doing massive downloads or they're watching lots of videos. And this is just, you know, ruining the quality of the network. So if someone needs to do a call on Microsoft Teams or a call on Zoom or so, it's going to break up the whole time. It's going to sound very unprofessional. It's going to look like a fly-by-night. So what can we do to... You know, remedy this situation. Is it answer A, port mirroring? No, guys. Port mirroring is used in most cases to go and investigate traffic, to go and inspect the traffic. So the traffic's going to be mirrored somewhere else, and that allows you or someone or something to inspect that traffic, to check for any anything weird, anything that stands out. So it's a way to monitor the traffic in your environment to see if anyone is up to some sort of shenanigans. So that's not going to improve the quality in any way or sense. It's just going to allow you to check if there's anything going on in your network. Answer B, quality of service. Yes, that's the answer. Now, for those of you that don't know, quality of service doesn't just consist of one thing. It's a collection of things. And one of the things it consists of is something called bandwidth management, which is what we're looking for here. Because people are using excessive bandwidth. So if you or this company, or in this case, my company, has, let's say, a round number, let's say, a 100 meg line. It's a 100 meg internet line, and these people are abusing this 100 meg line to the point where there's just not enough bandwidth left for people to go and do video conferencing. What you can do with bandwidth management, you can go and dedicate a certain amount of bandwidth to certain types of traffic. I can, for instance, go and dedicate 80 megs of this 100 meg line to normal web browsing and, you know, watching videos and downloads and all kinds of stuff. 10 megs I can go and dedicate to audio, you know, in like Zoom and Teams calls and stuff. And other 10 megs I can go and dedicate to the video in these video conferencing calls. Now, even if someone is not making a video conferencing call, it doesn't matter. That last 10 or 20 megs is reserved. So people downloading and people watching videos on YouTube and whatever they're doing on the internet, they can never access the last 20 megs. It's reserved for certain types of traffic. That, guys, is called bandwidth management. And that's actually implemented in most medium to large size companies. How you do this and where you do this is up to you. My favorite place to go and do this is on the company's physical firewall. So we know the answer is B, but looking at answer C, port forwarding. So if someone is trying to access a specific PC or a specific server or resource in your company from outside your company, the place where they're going to end up is probably going to be the router or the router of your company. So they're going to use your company's public IP address or your home's public IP address. They're going to land at your router. And then from there, the traffic is not going to know where it needs to go. 
which machine, which server. Port forwarding will forward it to the correct machine or the correct server. So think of this as coming to my building. So if I happen to have a building and I've got lots of classrooms in this building and you guys want to come and attend a course in my building, when you come to my building, that's one thing. Think of that as the public IP address. You are going to land at the reception. And when you get to reception, you're not going to know where to go in this building of mine. Maybe there's many rooms and many classrooms. How are you going to know where to go? The receptionist, he or she will tell you, please go to classroom number 20 or go to classroom number 50. So that is kind of like a real example in real life of port forwarding. So that receptionist, he or she is acting like a router. They're basically doing a real life example of port forwarding, if you think about it. Looking at answer D, load balancing, something we did discuss once or twice already in this video. So load balancing is when you've got two or more of something and this is to split the load. So this could be traffic load. And it also gives you a sense of high availability, redundancy. It gives you a little bit of increase of a performance. So I can, for instance, go and get two or more of the exact same server. And they're going to render the exact same service. Or I can go and get two or more of the exact same network card and put that into a server. Or, you know, whatever. It's two or more of something. They're going to do the same something. And it's going to go and increase the performance and it's going to give you a form of redundancy and fault tolerance and high availability and all those fancy, fancy words. All right, folks, so just to recap, the answer here was indeed answer B, quality of service, more specifically because inside of quality of service, you get something called bandwidth management. Question 28. You have been asked by Burning Ice Tech to configure a wireless network and to ensure that users agree to an acceptable usage policy before connecting. Which of the following can you implement to achieve this goal? So you guys need to come to my pretend company and set up a wireless network for me. But now before people can go and connect to this wireless network of mine that you are setting up for me, I want these people to agree to some sort of policy first that says what they're allowed to do and what they're not allowed to do on my company wireless network. So it's a set of house rules basically. So if you want to use my network or my property, you've got to go and live abide by my rules, my house rules. Now, which of the following would allow me or you to achieve this goal? Is it answer A, role-based access? Now, guys, role-based access is actually also referred to as RBAC, which is role-based access control. This is basically the privilege or the permissions you give to someone what they can do and what they can do. So this could be NTFS permissions on premises, for example. In the cloud, this can be RBAC roles. You can do this on Office 365 or Microsoft 365. You can do this on Microsoft Azure. But it's not going to force people to agree to an acceptable usage policy first. So yes, I can control people can do and what they can do. But it doesn't have the ability to force people to agree to some sort of policy first before they will be granted access. RBAC doesn't achieve that. B, geofencing. So that's where I have the ability to go and limit people to a specific geographic location, for example. They've got to be at the office if they want to access my resources. Or they've got to be at home if they want to access my company resources. But once again, it does not ask people to accept a certain policy or house rules first before they can access my resources. So that's not going to achieve the goal we're hoping for here. On to C, a captive portal. Something I have mentioned once or twice in previous questions in this video. So that's something you'll normally find on wireless. And what are we dealing with here, guys? Wireless. Now, captive portal is something I mentioned of a coffee shop earlier. So if you try and jump on the wireless hotspot of a coffee shop, they might say it's free in most cases. But as soon as you try and connect, what are you going to see? You're going to land on the page. And it's probably going to ask you for a voucher or a pin or a password of some kind, which they're only going to give to you after you purchase something at their establishment. Seems fair. I mean, you can't just go and sit there and jump on their free Wi-Fi and not buy something. So I suppose that is fair. Now, that is a called a captive portal. Now, never mind this captive portal asking you for a username, a password or a pin or something. You can force people to agree to certain house rules. In other words, an acceptable usage policy, which we call an AUP. So this is the answer, folks. Answer C is the answer. So if you want to use my free Wi-Fi at my coffee shop, or in this case at Burning Ice Tech, a captive portal will allow you to achieve that. So before they can go and connect to it, 
it's going to ask them to agree to a certain policy. It's going to tell them, you are not allowed to use this internet to go to illegal websites, download pirate content. You're only allowed to visit legitimate sites for legitimate purposes, which has got to be, for example, work-related. So the answer is, and stay C, D, it's a firewall. It is a form of security. And I can control what sites you can visit and which ones not. But a firewall in no way or no sense can force people to go and accept a usage policy of any kind. I can simply control whether they can access stuff beyond their PC or the network or not. That's it. The answer is and remains captive portal. Question 29. A junior technician at Burning Ice Tech is working on a POTS. In other words, a plain old telephone system and needs to connect a connector. The junior asks you which type of connector to use for this. In other words, what I'm asking you guys here is what kind of connector do we use on a telephone cable? If I have to put this in simple terms, what kind of connector do we use on a telephone cable? Can any one of you guys remember? I did actually mention this earlier in the video as well. So we have asked a couple of questions already in this video with different kinds of connectors. And then some of those other questions, I had way more connectors available. So if you guys remember, then you might know what the answer here is. So answer A, RJ45. What do we use that for? Can anyone remember? That's for like Cat5, Cat5e, Cat6, Cat6a. So that's for normal networking cables that you would use on a laptop or a desktop, for instance, or a server on switches and stuff. It's got nothing to do with telephone cables. RJ11, what is that for? That indeed is for telephone cables and it's the only one we use for telephone cables. So telephone cables are referred to as a POTS line. They're also referred to as a, well, a telephone cable. And we also call them CAT3. Almost nobody knows that, but believe it or not, it's also called CAT3. Now you actually get two kinds of CAT3, absolutely not part of this course. You don't need to know that. They definitely won't ask you this in the exam. But there used to be two types of CAT3. One was used for computers, a normal networking cable. They kind of discontinued this, I think, this in the 90s somewhere. And it had a maximum speed of about 10 megabits per second. Can you believe it? That was excruciatingly slow. And then the other kind of CAT3 cable you got, which was obviously telephone cable. And until, until recently, a lot of people still use telephone cables. Funny how times change, right? So we know the answer is B. Um, not sure if you guys remember this, but ST and LC, if you look at answer C and D there, ST and LC is fiber cable connectors. You remember I said anything of two letters is fiber cables. The answer is and remains B, R, J, 11. Question 30. You need to create and run virtual machines at a company called Burning Ice Tech, which the following provides you a virtualized hardware environment so you can go and run and create virtual machines. Is it answer A, Docker? No, guys. Docker does help you with virtualization, but it's specifically used to create and run something called containers. So if you guys know what a container is in a virtual environment, yes, Docker would have been the answer. It's a Linux tool, but you do get it on Windows. And if you want to use that tool, you, need, you do need to be familiar with a little bit of Linux, and you need to be familiar with PowerShell. It's a, it's a somewhat complex tool to go and use. So most people don't use it because it's quite complex. Most people instead use virtual machines because the hypervisors you use for virtual machines is a lot easier. And if anyone paid attention there, you might know what the answer now is. So Docker, yes, for virtualization, but not for virtual machines. That's for containers. Very much the same as a virtual machine, but containers don't actually have their own operating system. They share it with the host PC. Where virtual machines, on the other hand, they have their own operating system. You can choose the operating system. Answer B, firewall. That has got absolutely nothing to do with virtualized hardware environments. Firewalls is just used to control security on your machine or your network. And I can go and block or allow IP addresses, websites, you know, URLs, emails, that kind of stuff. But it's got absolutely nothing to do with virtualized environments, guys. A router, that is to route traffic over the internet or to route you out of one network into another network in your company environment. But once again, has nothing to do with virtualized environments. The answer is answer D. And you guys probably knew that. So a hypervisor is what we use to create virtual machines and manage and run virtual machines. You get many kinds. You, for example, get Hyper-V, which is Microsoft's version of hypervisor. They literally took the word hypervisor and they just shortened it to Hyper-V, 
not very creative the name if you ask me and you get third party ones like vmware you get oracle virtual pc virtual box there is many but in a nutshell the answer here guys is a hypervisor that is what you would go and use to create and manage and run virtual machines question 31 one of the following connectors is not a fiber optic cable connector which one does not get used for fiber optic cables now this one is going to be an interesting one guys i played around a little bit of the connectors here so i added a bunch of connectors that you guys would have seen in my previous questions and then i added one little extra one there maybe two little extra ones there so if you guys paid attention in the previous questions in this video where I showed you a bunch of connectors, I think there's already been like two or three questions where I asked you about connectors. Which one would you use for this? Which one would you use for that? So if you paid attention there, you would already know which ones are fiber, you know, the fiber ones we discussed in the previous videos. But this time around, I added an extra fiber one. Mm. So ST, LC, and SC, those three are definitely fiber because in the previous questions I told you, Anything you see with two letters is a fiber cable connector. But I did, however, mention that not all fiber cable connectors are two letters. Some of them are not two letters. So that's going to be between answer C and answer E. Answer C being a B and C connector, folks, that's used for coaxial. I think I did actually mention that in one of the previous questions. That's for good old-fashioned coaxial cable, which is a legacy cable. And if you look at the last one there, MT... RJ, there's actually supposed to be a dash there between the MT and RJ. I forgot to add it there. That is a form of fiber cable connector. And you do get other ones as well, which is also not mentioned here. It's crazy how many kinds of fiber cable connectors you get here. So now that we know E is also fiber, which one is the answer? Which one is not fiber? That would be answer C, guys. B and C, that's for coaxial cables. Question 32. Which of the following services enables computers on a private IP version 4 network to access the internet using a registered IP address? Hmm, is it DNS? No, guys. DNS, as you guys might remember earlier in the video, is to convert IPs to names and names to IPs. It's not the only thing it does, but it's one of the main things it does. So if you go to a browser and you type in a web address like youtube.com, your machine doesn't know what that is. It doesn't know where that is. Your machine is going to contact something called the DNS. It's going to say, listen, bro, what is this? Where is this? The DNS is going to tell your machine, okay, cool, I've got you. It's going to go and pull a record for that site. And it's going to get the IP address for that site. It's going to tell your machine what the IP address is. And your machine is going to follow that and it's going to get to the website. That is a DNS in a nutshell. It's not the only thing it does, but that's one of the main things it does. Answer B, NAT. Network address translation. I did briefly discuss this in the video earlier, and I definitely discussed this in my training videos on my on my channel. So if you guys go and check the, the Network Plus course for the N10-009, there's a video that I made that specifically covers this topic, where I cover the topic of NAT. So if you are inside your home or office environment, that is called your private network. It's inside your building. It's private. And any IP address you've got in there is considered private. But as soon as you or a user goes to the outside world, you know, the internet, you've got to go through what to get there? The router. Or some of you guys might call it the router. And as soon as you go online, what do you have? A public IP address. Inside your home or your office, you've got a private IP address. A unique private IP address. Which you could either have allocated statically or dynamically. As soon as you go through the router, you've got a public IP address. Now, where does it get converted from private to public? And what does that? It's on the router, guys. Your router does something called NAT. That is the answer here. So a public IP address is a registered IP address. So the answer is here is obviously not C and D. So if you're wondering what C and D is, C being ADDS stands for Active Directory Domain Services. That is a role you install on a server which allows you to, well, have Active Directory for the most part. And that's going to allow you to create user accounts and groups and group policy objects and all that kinds of jazz. D being DHCP, that's also a role. Actually, three of these are roles with the exception of NAT. DHCP is a role you can go and add on a server which will allow you to go and dish out IP addresses. It is a feature or function that's built into most routers which is turned on by default on most routers which also dishes out IP addresses. But it does not convert IPs, it just dishes out IP addresses. 
So some people might have said the answer here is DHCP because when you hear IP address, you automatically think DHCP. DHCP gives IP addresses, but it does not convert private to public and public to, to private. That is the function of a NAT. Question 33. The company Burning Ice Tech is asking you to create an IP version 4 network. This network, guys, needs to have 8 subnets and 30 hosts per subnet. You have been assigned a class C network address. Which of the following subnets will you have to go and use? All right, so what I need from you guys is I need you to tell me which of the following subnet masks down below will allow me to have at least eight subnets, but also at least 30 hosts per subnet. So what I mean by 30 hosts is I need at least 30 IP addresses. Remember, we would normally try and waste as little IP addresses as possible, so we don't want to give more than what we need. So, with that in mind, I think to help with this again, I'm going to show you guys that table we had before, the one I told you guys that you guys can go and write before the exam. Here we go. So, looking at this table of mine, remember, we want eight subnets, so in other words, eight networks, but we also want 30 IP addresses, or we want to be able to support 30 hosts. Looking at this table of mine, the answer should be quite clear, guys. It's literally there in the middle. 2255.224. It supports 32 IP addresses, of which 30 are usable, so in other words, 30 hosts, and it's got eight networks, so we've got eight subnets. So that one actually fits perfectly, but in real life, I can tell you now, it's not always going to be as perfect as that. So the answer here, folks, if I take you guys back to my list of answers, is in the middle there. 2255.224 supports 30 hosts and 8 subnets. So you guys are really going to be so much better off if you go write the N plus exam, but before doing so, you write down that table of mine. Anyway, moving on to question 34. Which of the following is the default subnet mask for an IP version 4 class A network? All right, so we should know the answer by now, guys. So what I'm going to do is there is four kinds of subnet masks as default, default as it gets. I think the most default one out of those will probably be answer C of a 2255.0. So that is the most well-known one, the most commonly used one. 2255.0, folks, being answer C is class C. So that means anybody on that network, the first three octets of their IP address needs to be the same for them to be on the same network. If you look at answer B with the double two five five in the front, anybody on that network, only the first two octets needs to be the same with their IP address for them to be on the same network. Class C supports 256 IPs minus two, so it's 254. Class B supports 16,000 odd, that's a lot. And then answer A, is class A. <laughs> the fact that it's like that is just a coincidence, guys. Now, I just spotted that now as I'm explaining this to you guys. Answer A is class A. Answer B is class B. And answer C is class C. I can unsee it now. Now that, I, now that I see it, I can unsee it. It's just weird that it worked out like that. So if you see just 1255 in the front, that means only the first octet for everybody's IP address needs to be the same for them to be on the same network. That's a very large network, guys. And that's actually the answer here. So it supports about 16 million odd IP addresses. That's that's a lot, guys. The last one is something I kind of sort of made up. So I suppose you can call it class D. Class D is actually experimental. So it kind of does exist, but it also doesn't. So the only official ones is normally class A, B, and C. D, if you go down a search for it, you'll see D does exist, but it also doesn't. It's, it's experimental. So A, B, and C is the main ones, guys. And the answer here is A. Question 55. The encrypted version of web browsing, being HTTPS, uses a different port than the normal unsecured version of HTTP. Which port is used by HTTPS? So this is actually a very straightforward question. If I really wanted to, I could have just said, hey guys, what is the port number for HTTPS? I could have literally have just said that, but then it looks kind of silly, these questions. It looks like a fly-by night, and it's not going to give you the sense of how they might ask it in the exam. I mean, I personally think CompTIA unnecessarily complicates some of the questions in the exam. So I'm doing the same thing here. I'm unnecessarily complicating these questions because I'm trying to get you guys into the theme of how they may or may not ask this in the exam. It doesn't help I say, hey, what's the port for HTTPS? And now you get to the exam and they ask you the same thing, but they go overly complicated and now you're not used to it and now you start stressing your butt off. 
But if you've kind of gotten used to how I phrase my questions and they go and do more or less the same thing in the exam, then at least you're not going to go have a little bit of a panic attack. So in short, guys, what is the port number for HTTPS? Looking at the available answers, a quick reminder, 22 is for SSH, secure shell, so that's remote connecting to a console. 23 is Telnet, also remote connecting to a console, but that's clear text, SSH is encrypted. Port 25 is SMTP, so that's the old school way of sending email. Port 53 is DNS, converting IPs to names and names to IPs. Port 80 is normal HTTP, so that's the clear text version, not the one we want. Port 110 is POP3, the old school way of receiving email. And then the last one, which is actually our answer here, folks, 443 is HTTPS, encrypted web browsing. So the answer is G, 443. Question 36. You have been asked to configure a DHCP server for a company called Burning Ice Tech. Which of the following devices would you configure as a DHCP server? All right, so guys, where and how do we normally get DHCPs? Where will we normally find this? So this has actually been mentioned multiple times in this specific video, and it's been mentioned many times in my other normal training course videos. So let me ask it this way. What device by default comes with DHCP built into it and by default has DHCP turned on? That, folks, is a router. So routers, almost all of them have DHCP built into them, and on almost all of them, DHCP is turned on by default. So in your home environment or a small office environment, your DHCP is probably going to be your router, but in a medium to a large size organization, those companies would normally turn off the DHCP function on a router because they want to go and build their own on a server. So they're going to go and add a role on a server called DHCP, and that gives them way more functions and features and functionality. So the answer here, folks, is C. That's the only one that's a router here. A is a switch. does not have DHCP functionality. That is just to connect different devices on a network to one another. A bridge is to connect you from one network to another network for the most part. And a hub is, for the most part, extinct. Very much the same thing as a switch, except a hub is referred to as a dumb device. Everything connected to this device, which looks like a switch, but it's called a hub, everything there is going to see everything everything else is doing. So if I send you something on a network, everything is going to get that something and see that something. A hub does something called broadcasting. So if I want to send you something specifically, everybody's going to get that something, not just you. But a switch will send that something specific to just you, keeping it private. Anyway, the answer here, folks, is C, that one it's got router. Question 37. During a successful lease renewal transaction for clients and servers, which of the following message types are exchanged by DHCP? Choose all that apply. Now, I'm going to make this interesting. I'm going to give you guys eight answers to choose from. The reason I'm going to give you eight is because I need four answers from you. And if there was only four answers, then all of them would be correct. So that's just not going to fly because I'm not going to be able to test you guys properly for the exam. So I needed to go and add a couple of false answers here and make it interesting, you know, make it a little bit harder for you guys to know the answers. So yeah, I accidentally spilled the beans there. I told you guys it's four answers I'm looking for. I'm not supposed to say that, but it's four answers, guys. So what is the steps for a DHCP? So if you guys don't know what a DHCP does, it dishes out IP addresses. So if you've got a laptop or a desktop that's set to dynamic, it's going to require an IP from the DHCP, and the DHCP is going to give it one. Now, how does it work, though? When you connect your laptop, desktop, tablet, or phone to a network, in the beginning, it doesn't have an IP address. And what it's going to do, folks, it's going to do a bit of a broadcast of sorts. It's going to say, hello, is there a DHCP on the network? And if there is one, which there normally is, it's going to say, yes, I'm here. How can I assist? Your machine's going to say, I need an IP address. The server's going to say, okay, cool, let me check. It's going to offer your machine an IP address. Your machine's going to see it. It's going to say, okay, cool, I'll take it. And then the machine's actually eventually going to give it to your PC. Now, to help this make it a little bit easier for you guys, I'm going to move these answer choices a little bit out of the way. I'm going to move it to the left because I'm going to list the four steps for you guys here on the right-hand side. And after listing it for you guys and explaining it to you guys, I think you guys will know what the answer is. All right, so step one. That, guys, is DHCP Discover. So you already know what the first answer is. That's going to be answer C. So DHCP Discover is when your device connects to a network and it says, Hello, is anyone there? Is there a DHCP? 
That's called DHCP Discover. It's basically doing a bit of a broadcast, asking if there's a DHCP on our network, and it's probably going to be one. Step two. That step is the DHCP is going to offer your device an IP address. So you can probably guess what the answer is going to be if you look at the answer choices. It's called DHCP Offer. So step two, the DHCP receives that ARP request saying, hello, I'm looking for a DHCP. The DHCP is going to say, okay, cool. How about this IP address? And it's going to offer your device an IP, not give it, just offer one. Your device will receive this offer. It's then going to look at the offer. And then we move on to step three, DHCP request. Your device is then going to request that IP that it just had a look at. It's going to say, okay, cool. I like it. I will take it. And that is step three where it says DHCP request. After your device requests it, your DHCP will give it to you being called DHCP acknowledge. So step one, DHCP discover. Your device sends out a request saying, hey, I'm looking for a DHCP. Step two, the DHCP replies if there is one. And that's called DHCP offer. It offers an IP, does not give it yet. Step three, your machine or device looks at the offer. It says, cool, I will take it. That's called DHCP request. And then step four, the DHCP server, whether it be on your router or an actual server, is going to give the actual IP being DHCP acknowledge. So the four answers, folks, is B, C, G, and H. Question 38. You need a cloud service model that enables you to perform a new installation of an operating system of your choice, not the cloud provider's choice. Which of the following cloud service models will allow you to do this? So what I'm actually asking you guys here in a nutshell is I want to know which one of these cloud service models gives you enough control for you to still be able to choose the operating system of your thingy, your virtual machine perhaps. Is it A, software as a service? No, folks. Software as a service is the one where you've got the least amount of control. So earlier in this video, we discussed the different kinds of public cloud you get. We discussed software as a service, platform as a service, infrastructure as a service, and then there was a fourth one, which I completely sucked out of my thumb. It didn't even exist. Software as a service, for those of you that remember, is the one we had the least amount of control. It's literally just software running somewhere else, and it's installed somewhere else, but you do not have the ability to go and access the hardware, choose the hardware, or choose the operating system. It's not software as a service. Platform as a service, that one we've got more control. The example I gave you guys earlier is Active Directory in the cloud, but it does not give you the ability to choose the operating system. You cannot choose the specs of the machine, like the RAM and the CPU and the hard drive space. So platform as a service, you still don't have enough control. Now, answer C there is something new that I did not list earlier, but I did briefly mention it. DAAS, that is desktop as a service. So it's very much the same as running a virtual machine in the cloud. So IAAS is infrastructure as a service. And the example I gave you guys there is a virtual machine in the cloud. You've got a lot of control. And earlier, that was the one where we had the most control. Desktop as a service, very similar to infrastructure as a service but you don't quite have as much control as infrastructure as a service. Desktop as a service is virtual machines in the cloud. It could be, but they've kind of sort of already been pre-made for you. So someone went, the cloud provider, for instance, they went and pre-made you a virtual machine. It's already got an operating system on it and all that, and you don't really get to choose it. You just get to use it. So you're going to be up and running quicker, yes, but you're not going to be able to choose the operating system. And this question specifically says you need to be able to choose the operating system. It needs to be your choice. So you need to have so much control to the point where you can even choose the operating system. The only one that allows you to do that, guys, is infrastructure as a service. You have the most control on that cloud service model. The answer is D. Question 39. Which of the following can be monitored by HVAC systems by using Internet of Things, more commonly known as IoT for short. Now, I need more than one answer from you guys here. So I want to know what can you or someone monitor of HVAC systems? It's normally going to be done remotely. The system is normally going to be central in a building, but it doesn't mean you have to be in the building. You can actually monitor it remotely. I used to do this for quite a few of my clients. There's certain things you can monitor, and never mind monitor, there's certain things you can control with the system. I kid you not. 
There's a video in my playlist, my N10-009 Networking Plus playlist that you guys can go and check out. I think it's called Networked Devices. I think it was lesson 15, if I'm not mistaken. It's either lesson 14 or 15. I stand to be corrected. I think it's lesson 15 in my playlist. Go check that video out. In the second half of that video, I specifically mention HVAC systems and I explain HVAC systems. If you'd like to know more about that, go check out specifically lesson 15. It's going to be towards the second half of that video, so you can skip ahead. Now, what HVAC systems allow you to monitor and control, guys, is humidity, temperature, and pressure, amongst many other things. But those are the three main things you can monitor and control. Cameras, no. You can monitor cameras via other ways. That's going to be a CCTV system, which is going to be like a DVR or an NVR. So that's a central system still, and it can also be done remotely, but it's not part of an HVAC system. That's a DVR system or an NVR system. Printers, if you want to manage them centrally, that's going to be a print server. So that's got nothing to do with HVAC systems. Occupancy, no. HVAC systems are not going to allow you to see the occupancy of something. And the same can be said about door locks. So the answer here, folks, is A, D, and E. If you'd like to know more about this, check out lesson 15 in the playlist. Question 40. Which of the following wireless security protocols provides the best security? Now, the answers I'm listing here for you guys, most of them are wireless security, but maybe not all. Maybe, maybe not. All right, so answer A, that is indeed wireless security, encryption, if you will. WEP, folks, is the first one, the oldest one. So it does provide security, but it's not the best because it's the oldest. Then answer D, yes, I'm going to go zigzag today. That's what came out after WEP. WPA is also wireless security. It's also encryption. It's newer than WEP, which means it's more secure and it's better. Then moving to answer B, WPA2. That is also wireless security. So A, B, and D, all three of those are wireless security. But WPA2 came out after WPA. So once again, it's newer and better. Now answer C, that's also security. It's also encryption, but it's got nothing to do with wireless. That is encrypted web browsing. It's got nothing to do with wireless security. So answer A, B, and D is wireless security. Answer A is the oldest and it's the least secure. Answer B is the newest and it's the most secure. You actually get WPA3 as well, which I didn't list here for you guys, but just FYI, you also get WPA3, which is even newer and even more secure, but it's not the option here. Now, there is a possibility in the exam, they might also ask you, out of those wireless securities, which one is the least secure, which one is the most secure? So the most secure is always the latest one, the least secure is always the oldest one. And what they will also do is they might not list all of them. They might, for example, not list WPA2, which is the most secure here. And they will list all the other ones and they'll ask you which one's the most secure. Then it's obviously just the next one on the list. And the same can be said about the least secure one. That is normally WEP. That's the least secure one, but they might not list it, which means it's the next one on the list, which will be WPA. And if that one's on the list, it'll be the next one on the list. Then the next one on the list, you get the idea. So the answer is WPA2, folks. Question 41. You need to put a disaster recovery mechanism in place which can be made operational in the least amount of time. Which of the following should you put in place? Now, guys, there's many forms of disaster recovery mechanisms you can go and put in place. Some of them can kick in instantly. Let's just say it like that. They can kick in nearly instantaneous or instantaneous. You or the user would never even know there was a disaster because it kicked in so freaking quickly, it was basically an instant switch over. Then you get disaster recovery mechanisms, which can get you back up and running very quickly, but it might take a couple of minutes or a couple of hours for you to fire the stuff up and all that to get stuff in place. And when you get those, which will, it'll get you there, but it might take like a whole week or two to get you up and running. So out of those things I've just mentioned, looking at answer A, a cold site that does exist, it will get you back up and running, but it could take days or even a week or two to get you back up and running. The benefits of a cold site is it's a lot cheaper to go and do that. The downside is it's going to take you or this company's business a lot longer to get back up and running. So you're going to have to go and evaluate for each business. Every business needs and requirements are different. Some of them cannot afford to be offline for very long. 
Other ones can. They can afford to be offline for a whole day or two or a whole week, and it's not really going to make a difference. So they just need to eventually get back up and running. So I suppose it depends on the nature of the business and how big this business is, what they do, that kind of jazz. Answer B, a warm site. That's going to get you up and running quicker than a cold site, but it's not going to be instantaneous. There's still going to be a couple of minutes, possibly a couple of hours before you're back up and running. And for some companies, they cannot afford to be offline for a couple of hours. That might be millions in damages. A hot site is nearly an instantaneous switchover. Sometimes it is an instantaneous switchover. Ideally, the users would not even know there was an issue to begin with. It's nearly instantaneous, so it's very reliable. Downside is you're going you're gonna to pay for it, guys. You're going to have to sell a sibling to be able to afford that. Really expensive. And an answer D, well, that's answer D. It says all the options. It's not all the options, guys. It's specifically answer C, a hot site. Question 42. Which of the following is the best description of biometrics? Is it something you know? No, guys. That is a factor when it comes to authentication. Something you know is something like a password, a pin, a phrase. Now, answer B, something you have. That's also a factor. That is something that you've got physically on your person, like a bank card, smart card, fob, thump. It could even be your mobile device because this mobile device receives a one-time pin, in other words, an OTP, and that's going to be on your device. There might be some sort of app you need to do some sort of acknowledgement on, on this device, like a banking app, um, the Microsoft Authenticator app, the Google Authenticator app, just to give you guys a few, but it's still on something that only you possess. Answer C is also a factor. Something you are is normally biometric in nature, and that is the answer here. So that could be a fingerprint scan, eye retina scan, voice recognition, face recognition. That's also a factor, but it's the biometric factor. Answer D, something you do is also a factor. It exists, but it's quite rare. So it's got to be something that you do specifically as a human. A certain way you walk, a certain way you talk, that kinds of stuff. Answer E, some place you are. Yes, that's a thing, guys. It's called a geographic lock. You or the user have got to be, geographically speaking, in a certain location before you can do something. So this could be to access a server, perhaps, or a cloud resource. Unless you are geographically at the office or at home, it's not going to allow you access. There's multiple ways we can achieve this goal, but it's usually based on public IP address. Anyway, the answer here, folks, is C. Something you are is biometric. Question 43. Which of the following refers to the process of determining whether a user is a member of a group that provides access to a particular network resource? Now, answer A, guys. Authentication. That is to check if you are who you claim to be, if you are the owner to this account, or if you are the owner to this device. So are you who you claim to be or what you claim to be? But it does not check what level of access you have. So this question wants to know, or in this question, I want to know which one of the following options allows the system to see what level of access you've got and what you've got access to. Not to check if you're the owner of the account or the device, which one of the following allows the system to check what level of access you've got? That's not authentication, guys. Authentication is just to check if you are who you claim to be. Answer B, authorization. Yes, that's the answer. Authorization is to check what level of access you've got after you've authenticated, after you've proven you are who you claim to be or what you claim to be. Now, authentication almost always takes place. You can think of that as step one. Authorization, which you can think of as step two, that does not always take place. I mean, if you look at something like a Facebook account, a Gmail account, or your own personal machine, once you've logged in, you've logged in. You've got full out access. So this will probably be like in a domain environment in a company. Once you've logged in and you've proven you're an employee or a member of this company or this organization, then the system will check, which is usually your Active Directory, what level of access you've got. In other words, privilege. NTFS permissions, roles, that kinds of stuff. That is authorization, guys. What are you authorized to see and do as that user and on that account? All right, and if you look at answer C, accounting. So that's to check the amount of resources a user has accessed. What resources they're accessing, the amount of resources they accessed, so when did they connect, how long they were connected. That's accounting. And auditing is very much the same thing if you look at answer D there. 
auditing is more specific logs, you know, from a security perspective. So auditing and accounting, there's a very fine line between these two. But at the end of the day here, folks, answer B is the correct one. Authorization has to check what level of access someone has after they've been authenticated. So that's going to determine what resources they can access and whatnot. Question 44. You have been asked by Burning Ice Tech to install a network cable in an environment where there is high EMI. So in other words, electromagnetic interference. The cable needs to provide decent speed, but cost is indeed a factor. Which of the following can be used? So what I need you guys to do is I need you to install a cable for me. But this environment where I need you guys to install it in, it's got very high EMI. So I need you guys to keep that into account. And I'm on a tight budget here. So I don't want the world's most expensive cable. So I need still decent speed out of this cable. I want speed. I want EMI protection. But I also don't want this to cost me an arm and a leg. What cable can I use or can you use? Is it A, UTP? No, guys, that's the least viable answer here. UTP is unshielded twisted pair. That's a normal network cable. It's got absolutely no immunity against EMI. Zilch. So it's definitely not A. Is it answer B? STP. That's shielded twisted pair. Now, STP gives you decent speed. It gives you a certain level of immunity against EMI. And it's not going to cost you an arm and a leg. So, so far, the answer is B. Well, I might as well tell you guys the answer actually is B. Looking at answer C, coaxial. It also has a certain level of immunity against EMI, but it's old legacy. So you're not going to get the world's best speed out of that. I need decent speed. I need EMI protection. So coaxial does tick that box, but I also need decent speed. It does not tick that box. Now, it's not going to cost me an arm and a leg, so it ticks that box. So two out of the three boxes have been ticked here. The one that does not tick is the decent speed box. Only STP ticks that box. If you look at fiber, the last answer there, it's probably the cable here that's the best when it comes to EMI. It's the most immune. It's completely immune. STP and coaxial is very immune, but it's not completely immune. Fiber optic cable is the only cable here that does not use copper. It uses glass and light. It's 100% completely immune to EMI. So if cost was not a factor, yes, fiber would have been the answer. But I specifically said cost is a factor. Realistically, a lot of companies cannot afford to use fiber because of how freaking expensive it is. So realistically in real life, and this is the case in this question of mine, you're going to have to use something like STP, which is way more affordable. And that's the answer here, guys. So if you get a question like this in the exam, which is similar to this, please check if cost is a factor. If cost is not a factor, you can go for fiber. If cost is a factor, then you should probably go look at something like STP. Also check if they mention speed, because sometimes they don't want to lose speed. So they might say speed is a problem, sometimes they don't care about speed. So check that out in the exam as well. Question 45. Please look at the image, guys. What does this tool in the image get used for? So I've got an image there for you guys on the right. I almost gave away the answer. I almost mentioned the name. <laughs> and if I mention the name, you're going to know what it's used for. I think a lot of you guys already know what it's used for, even if you're not in IT. So looking at the picture on the right hand side, what do we use that tool for guys? Is it A, can it be used to measure the length of a fiber optic cable by connecting it to one end? Uh, you get devices that does that, but it's not this one guys. Is it B, it generates a tone when connected at one end of the wire, which can be detected on the other end? No guys. B is something called a tone generator. Or a toner probe, as some folks call it. So if you have a network of lots of cables, or you just have a cable where it's going in the wall or the roof and you need to trace this cable and you don't know where it is, you can actually go and connect this toner probe to the one end of the cable and you've got this little wand that looks almost like a magic wand. If you hover it near the cable, it's actually going to start generating a tone, like a beep, 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 beep. And you can actually be, be able to detect where in the wall or where in the ceiling this cable is. Or if you just have like a lot of cables and you want to figure out which one is which, you can use that toner probe to figure out which is which as well. Answer C, can be used to detect and measure the electrical current flowing through a copper cable. Yes. Why? Because this is a multimeter, guys. Multimeters actually serve many purposes. You can go check the amps of something, the resistance of something. You can go check the voltage of something. In other words, the current flowing through a copper cable. Uh, so it can be used with a lot of things to do with electrical or electricity. 
Answer D, we obviously now know that's not the answer because I just said it's C. Used to punch down wires into receptacles. Now, guys, that would be a punch down tool. So if you've got a wall box and you need to punch down a network cable into it, you're going to use a punch down tool. If you have a patch panel and you need to patch the cables into the back of the patch panel, you're going to use a punch down tool. That's generally the two main places we would see people using that. And then as for answer A, which we know it's not the answer, those tools are actually very expensive, guys. So if you've got a fiber cable, because these cables can sometimes go very, very long distances, and if it broke somewhere along the line, and you've got absolutely no idea where, we use these tools, I can't remember the name of it right now, I'm striking a blank, but it sends a pulse through that cable. And depending on how long the pulse takes to bounce back or terminate, that will allow it to determine how far down the line this cable is broken. And we use this concept actually at a much, much bigger scale. If you look at the, the cables that connect different countries in the world together, you know, those ones that go on the ocean floor. Yes, we've got cables in the ocean, on the ocean floor that connects different countries together. Those are fiber optic cables, guys. Massive ones. And very often, these cables will break. You know, ships will go and have an anchor and they're going to hook these cables by accident or there's volcanic action underneath the ocean. And um, that all, you know, messes up these cables. Now, when this happens, obviously, we can't just see the cable. And the amount of distance that this stuff spreads or stretches is massive. So how the heck do we know where it's broken? They send a pulse through that cable. And depending on, you know, how long it takes and all that, they can determine exactly where the cable is broken. And then they send ships out to go and fix it. Question 46. Which of the following tools is used to connect an RJ45 connector to a network cable? Looking at answer A, is it that? No, guys, that's normal pliers. Is it answer B? Yes, that's a network crimper. They can be used to crimp RJ11 connectors. That's for telephone cables. Nobody does that anymore. And they can be used to crimp RJ45 connectors onto a Cat5, 5E, 6, and 6A cable. All of those normal Ethernet cables. So the answer is B. C is a wire stripper, so technicians do have those from time to time, but it's not something we see technicians using a lot. That's more for electricians, not technicians. Answer D is a punch-down tool. So if you were wondering what a punch-down tool looks like, since I mentioned that in the previous question, that's what it looks like, guys. That's a punch-down tool that we use in wall boxes or behind a patch panel. Question 47. Which of the following commands is used to test network connectivity to another device or another website? So all four of these answers I've got for you guys are command prompt commands. Which one of these four commands will allow you to go and test connectivity to another device or a website? Now I'm going to jump into it. The answer is ping, guys. Ping is something you go and type into command prompt followed by space. And after that, you're going to type in the IP address of the other device or the website or the name of the other device or website. It's going to by default send four very small packets of data to that device. And assuming your configuration is correct and there's no latency and all that, all four of those packets are going to reply normally within one or two milliseconds. You know, normally on average, it's going to be that quick, depending on how far this item is away. That's what we want to see. Now, depending on how long they take to reply um, or whether they all reply or not or whether they don't reply at all, that'll determine whether this connection is working or not, how good it is, how fast it is, how stable it is. So the answer is ping. NS lookup allows you to go and see your DNS information. So you can go and see your DNS information. Trace it is a command we go and use to trace something, to see how many hops it takes to get to that website or that device. It also allows you to see where there might be a fault on the line, where. So if you're going to do 10 hops, which is probably going to be 10, 10 routers you're going to go through to get to the destination, you can see where the problem might potentially be, where the connection is dropping. So if you suspect there's a problem, but not in your building, but somewhere along the line over the internet, you can use Tracer to see where exactly the connection is dropping, where the problem is. And then the last one there, guys, netstat. That command displays the contents of various network-related data structures for active connections. So this netstat function shows the state of all configured interfaces. So folks, in a nutshell, the netstat command generates displays that show network status and protocol statistics. Pretty much all it does. So you can display the status of TCP and UDP endpoints in table format, routing table information, and interface information. But the answer here, guys, remains A, ping. 
Question 48. You have been called into Burning Ice Tech to help with troubleshooting a computer that does not have access to the internet. Surprise, surprise. I mean, that's as common as it gets. Please observe the demo and then choose from the list of available answers what command you think needs to be run next to resolve this issue. All right, guys. So I've got a couple of commands there for you guys at the bottom. There we go. And I'm going to show you guys a demo now. So I'm going to go into a virtual machine. I'm going to run a command on this virtual machine. The command I'm going to run is going to be ipconfig. This will show you basic IP or network information about this virtual machine. And looking at that, you need to tell me what you think the problem is. Well, you probably don't have to tell me what the problem is. You should probably just tell me what the solution is to this problem. So if you know what the problem is, you would know what the solution is. So let me switch over to my virtual machine in the background. Yes, I'm actually going to switch over to a virtual machine. It's going to be very quick. I'm going to run the command very quickly. And then we're going to come back here and you can check what you think the answer might be. So switching over. A few moments later. All right, folks, here we are on that virtual machine of mine. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go here to the bottom left and I'm going to go run a search for CMD. In other words, command prompt. There we go. The command I'm going to type in here is ipconfig. And like I said just a few moments ago, this is the command you type into command prompt to show you this specific machine's basic networking information. So I'm going to go and press enter. You'll see it's very short information that it shows me. So normally what it would do here is it's going to show you this machine's IP address, its subnet mask, and its default gateway if it has one. Now the moment that is the IP address, so I hope you guys know what that is. So if you paid attention in my course videos, you would know what that IP address means. So now I'm going to ask you guys again, what command do you need to run next to be able to solve this issue? So if you have a user and he or she is moaning and groaning, they don't have access to internet or something like that, and you run the ipconfig command and you see what we see in front of us, what do you think you need to run next? So I'm going to take you guys back to the available answers. Let's see if you guys can figure this one out. All right, here we are. Okay, so now that we have seen that little demo or whatever you guys want to call it, what do you think you need to run next? Is it A, ipconfig fix? Guys, that's a fake command. It doesn't exist. I literally made that up, completely sucked it out of my thumb. So A is definitely not the answer. Is it answer B? ipconfig forward slash release. Now that's a command we normally use with DHCP. So if you have a device like a laptop or a desktop and it's set to dynamic, which is usually the default, and you need to release your old IP address, most likely because that has expired, that is the command you would go and run. So that's only if you have a laptop or a desktop, if you have a dynamic IP and it has most likely expired, then you're gonna go and type ipconfig and you're gonna go and type forward slash release. Um, answer C, ipconfig forward slash renew. That is the command you type after ipconfig release. So release is to release your old IP that's now expired. Renew is to ask for a new one or to renew your old IP address. So it's basically a follow-up command. And then answer D, that is a valid command, but that is just to show you more information than what we saw earlier. So earlier when I typed in ipconfig, that's to show you basic networking information. And if you go and type in ipconfig forward slash all, it's going to show you the same information, but so much more. You're going to be able to see the MAC address, which you guys might know as physical address. You're going to be able to see way more than that. You're going to be able to see whether this machine is on dynamic or static, uh, when the lease expires potentially, or does it have an IP address, that kinds of stuff. Now, with regards to what the answer here, guys, is, it is answer C. Now, normally, when we want to go and renew our IP address, we first go and type release, which is to release the old IP, and then we follow up with ipconfig renew. But in this instance, we're going to say ipconfig renew, we're going to skip release, because there is nothing to release. If you guys paid attention to the IP address, you would have noticed it starts with 169.254. That is not really an IP address. We call that a PIPA. It means you don't have an IP address. So when you or someone's device is unable to get an IP address from a DHCP for whatever reason, you get a PIPA, which means 169.254.something.something. And since we saw a PIPA there, it means that machine does not 
have an IP address. That is why we cannot access anything on the network and all that. So we're going to skip the release part because there is nothing to release. And we're going to go straight to the renew part. So that is the answer here, folks. Answer C. Question 49. Which of the following wireless standards supports both the 2.4 gigahertz frequency as well as the 5 gigahertz frequency? All right. So here is the answers, guys. Is it 802.11a? No, guys, that frequency or standard only runs at the 5 gigahertz frequency. Is it 802.11b? No, guys, that frequency only runs at 2.4 gigahertz. Is it 802.11g? No, that one also only runs at 2.4 gigahertz. So the only one that's left here by process of elimination is the last one, which is n. That one, guys, runs indeed at 2.4 as well as 5 gigahertz. Moving on to question 50. You need to install a network cable in an environment with extremely high EMI. So that's electromagnetic interference. The user wants good speed and cost is not of concern. So earlier we had a similar question. I gave you guys a similar question, but there I said cost is of concern. So we have to take that into account. Here, I also have a bit of an EMI scenario for you guys, but this time cost is not of concern. So if you remember what we said earlier in the earlier question, you might know what the answer is already. So which of the following cables could be installed in this situation? All right, so there's the cables there in front of us. Now out of these cables, guys, since cost is not a factor, but we also want speed, what cable would be the best? All right, so UTP, that is not immune to EMI at all. And um, it's just a normal network cable. So UTP is completely out. That is unshielded twisted pair. STP was the answer previously in the previous question because it still gave us decent speed, but it was at a reasonable cost. So it's somewhat immune to EMI, not completely, but reasonably. Coaxial, the third one there, is also somewhat immune to EMI, but it's going to give you terrible speed and it's old legacy. So coaxial is definitely out for this one as well. D, which is fiber optic, that cable is the only cable which is 100% completely immune to EMI. Now, the reason why we did not choose that previously is because it's very expensive. Previously, in the other question I had for you guys, cost was a factor. So we could not choose fiber optics since that is too expensive. But since now cost is not a factor, we can go and choose fiber optic. But if cost was a factor, I would suggest you guys go for STP because it's a lot cheaper and it still does give you a reasonable level of immunity to EMI. So please make sure you read your questions properly in the real exam. Um, obviously, they can phrase this any way they want. Make sure you check if cost is of concern. Make, you check, make sure you check other things like speed and all those variables because that can have a very huge influence on the actual answer at the end of the day, guys. Question 51. You have been called into Burning Ice Tech for a printer-related issue. Currently, one of the printers is getting a new, different IP address every day from the DHCP, which is causing issues with printing, as you guys can imagine. The printer needs to receive the same IP address every day, which of the following would resolve the issue being experienced. So what we need here is we need this printer to receive an IP from the DHCP, but it needs to be the same IP every day. By default, the DHCP will just randomly allocate a random IP address to a random device from the pool you specified. But if we need the printer to receive the same IP address every day, how do we achieve that? So I hope you guys paid attention in the DHCP video in this course. So there's a video that says DHCP. Please go check that out if you don't understand this concept. I completely explained the whole concept to you guys in that video. So it's like literally going to say very big in the thumbnail of the video, DHCP. So looking at answer A, exclusion. No, that's not the answer. Exclusion is to exclude a certain IP from the scope. So if you have specified your scope, which is also known as your range, and let's say for argument's sake, you've got approximately 100 IP addresses in that scope, which is going to be issued. But in that 100 IP addresses range, there's one or two IPs you do not want to have dished out to devices. This could be for any reason. Maybe you've statically assigned those to something like a server. 
So we don't want to go and dish out an IP address which has already been si assigned to something else like a server. So in that situation, you would go and create what we call an exclusion. Those IP addresses that you've now statically assigned to something like a server, we're going to go and create an exclusion for those IP addresses. So in this case, we do want the IPs to be dished out, you know, if you look at the question, but we want the same IP to be dished out. Exclusion is not going to achieve that goal. Answer B, a reservation. Yes, guys, that is the answer. So when you go to your DHCP, this is normally going to be done on an actual DHCP server. Very rarely will you find a router to the DHCP that's got this functionality. Some of them do and some of them don't, but don't expect to find it there. But an actual DHCP server where you go and install the DHCP role on a server, there you can go and create what we call a reservation. So you reserve a certain IP for a certain device. And the way we do that is to type in that device's MAC address. You folks might also know this as the physical address of that device. So you're going to go to your server. You're going to go and type in the MAC address of that printer. And then after that, the same IP address will be dished out to the same printer every day over and over. So the answer here is B. Looking at answer C, add the printer to the whitelist of the MAC filter. This has got nothing to do with a MAC filter, guys. The whitelist of a MAC filter is normally something you'll find on a router or an access point, probably on a router. So if someone wants to connect to your access point or your router, wirelessly in most cases, their MAC address has to be in that whitelist. Failing which, even if they have the password of that Wi-Fi, they will not be able to connect because their device's MAC address is not in that whitelist. We're not talking about connecting to networks here. We're talking about people that's not getting an IP address. So C is a bit unrelated. The last answer there, power cycle the printer. That is just a fancy way to go and say, restart your printer. I typed it like that on purpose because they like to go and do that sometimes. So power cycle is sometimes referred to as restarting. Other times they'll go and say in reverse, they'll say cycle power. Instead of power cycle, they'll say power cycle or cycle power. It's, it's whack the way they type it sometimes. So I'm going to go and type it weird on purpose because you never know how they might phrase it. It simply means restart the printer and see if that solves any issues. Anyway, folks, the answer here is B. Question 52. Which of the following types of interference on a twisted pair network are designed to be prevented by the twists in the wire pairs inside the cable. Now, if you guys don't know what that means, if you go look inside a normal, normal network cable, you'll normally find about eight wires. So if you cut it open, you'll see eight wires. Blue, blue, white, orange, orange, white, green, green, white. You know, you get the idea. Now, if you really pay close attention, you'll notice in most of these cables, those are twisted around one another. So blue and blue, white, they'll be twisted around one another. Green and green white, they are twisted around one another. Why is that? There's a reason behind that. So it is to prevent something. But what are we trying to prevent here? We're trying to prevent some sort of interference. So if you look at the question, you probably gathered that we're trying to prevent some sort of interference. But what kind of interference are we trying to prevent by twisting the wires around one another? So looking at the four answers I've got here for you guys, I'm going to keep it quite interesting. I've giving you guys answers which are very close to one another. That's on purpose. I'm throwing you guys a bit of a curveball here because I want to test you guys and see how well you know this. So I'm going to give you the answer. The answer is crosstalk. Crosstalk is when those little wires inside your cable influence one another. So there's eight wires, and believe it or not, those small little eight wires, they actually give off a very small magnetic field. And uh, that actually influences one another. And we call that crosstalk. Now you might say, hey, but that sounds like EMI. It is, kind of. Crosstalk, RFI, and EMI is generally basically the same thing. RFI and EMI is exactly the same thing. It's just different ways of saying it. But, there's a but here. EMI and RFI is usually caused by an external source. So if you've got an external power wire or an external fluorescent light, or some sort of heavy machinery that's near your network cable, that's an external source of electromagnetic interference, and that we just normally call EMI or RFI. But the eight little wires inside your cable, yes, they have EMI, and yes, they influence one another, but when those wires influence one another, we don't call it EMI or RFI, even though that's technically, technically correct. We specifically refer to that as crosstalk. 
And that is what I want you guys to understand here. So there's a very good chance they might ask that. And if they ask that, the answer they're looking for is crosstalk. Even though if you said EMI or RFI, you would technically be correct. They want to see if you say crosstalk. I've had so many fights of CompTIA about this. Uh, because technically, if you would have gone and said EMI, and let's say you failed this exam of 1%, you're technically correct. And technically, you passed this exam. But now, technically, just because you didn't say crosstalk, you failed the exam. So in my opinion, I would have marked you correct. I mean, if this was my test, I would have marked you correct because technically EMI would still be correct. But they're looking for a specific term in this instance, and that is crosstalk. So be careful of that, guys. If wires influence one another, you know, specifically inside the cable, we call that crosstalk. Question 53. Which of the following does not prevent unauthorized people from entering a data center? All right, so here's a couple of random answers for you guys. They're all security related because I'm trying to throw you guys off your game again. The whole purpose is for me to test you. So biometric scans. Can I prevent unauthorized people from entering, you know, physically into a data center with a biometric scan? Yes. Biometric scans are going to stop them dead in the tracks because if it's not their finger or their retina eye scan or anything, it's not going to work. They need to go and provide a fingerprint or something like that. And if they're not that person, they ain't going to get in. Answer B, identification badges. Yes, that'll also work. That's going to stop people in their tracks because if they don't have the badge physically on their person, they're not going to get in. So biometrics, that's a factor, but it's something you are. And badges is a factor, but it's something that you've got in your possession. But in both cases, they're not going to get in. So it's not A, it's not B. Motion detection. Now, motion detection is, in fact, the answer here, guys. It's a security mechanism. Yes, it's going to allow you to know when someone's in the data center, but it's not going to prevent them from getting into the data center. So you might say, oh, shuck, someone is in there, but is a motion sensor going to prevent them from getting in there? No, it's not. It's just going to let you know they're in there, but it's not going to stop them from getting in there. If you look at the last answer, the key fobs, that's something, once again, people need to physically have in their possession. So it's something they have. And without that in their position, they're not going to get in. So I hope you guys understand the question here. We want to prevent them from getting in. We don't want to just know when they're there. We want to prevent. And motion detection is not going to prevent. It's just going to let you know they have been there. It's the same as a security camera. Security camera would have been the same as a motion detection. You're going to know they're there or you're going to know who was there but it's not going to stop them from committing this crime or whatever it might be. Question 54. Which of the following types of RAID requires a minimum of two hard drives to work and does something called mirroring? All right, so here's the different kinds of RAID you get. Now, keep in mind, I may or may not have put a few fake ones in here. Uh, who am I kidding? I did put a fake one in there, so... A, RAID 0, that is a real type of RAID you get. RAID 1, at answer B, that's also real. Um, answer C, RAID 2, I made that up because I had to fill the gap. It's going to look weird if I just give you guys three possible answers. So I made RAID 2 up, does not exist. And answer D, RAID 5, that does in fact exist. Now, I could have actually gone and put in a different kind of RAID in there besides RAID 2 because you do actually get different kinds of RAIDs other than 0, 1, and 5. I mean, you get RAID 6, you get RAID 10, just to name a few. Uh, but where's the fun in that? So I like to throw in a couple of curveballs from time to time. Now, out of these RAIDs, RAID 0, 1, and 5, which one of those does something called mirroring? Now, folks, RAID 0 does something called striping, not mirroring, so it's not RAID 0. RAID 0 is used to increase performance. You need a minimum of two hard drives, and it's going to increase performance, but it does not give you redundancy. It does not give you fault tolerance, and the redundancy slash fault tolerance aspect, that's, that's the mirroring that we're referring to here. So it's not answer A. Uh, answer B, RAID 1. That needs a minimum of two hard drives, and it does, in fact, do something called mirroring. So that is the answer here, guys. So RAID 1, you need a minimum of two hard drives. These two hard drives are not going to give you more space, but it will be clones of one another. Since they're clones of one another, you will have what we call redundancy. 
or full tolerance. So God forbid, if something were to happen to one of your hard drives, you don't lose your data since you would have a clone of that data on another hard drive. We call that mirroring. Now, RAID 2, we know that does not exist. RAID 5, that is something you'll normally find on servers. RAID 0 and 1 is possible on desktop PCs, but we don't do that anymore. The last time that we did that was probably about 10, 20 years ago. Because back in the day, we didn't exactly have solid state drives to get more speed and all that kinds of stuff. And um, if you did want to do RAID back then, you needed to know what RAID was, you needed to know how to go and implement it, and you needed to make sure you've got a special motherboard and all that. Nowadays, guys, it's just quicker, cheaper, and easier just to get yourself a solid state drive. Now, with regards to RAID 5, just to shed some light on what that actually does, you can only do that on service. You need a minimum of three hard drives, and it's going to do mirroring as well as striping. And it also includes a parity bit. Now, in RAID 5, you can afford to lose one hard drive, and you can actually carry on exactly like normal. But you cannot afford to lose more than one hard drive. Then you're going to lose your data, guys. Anyway, answer is B, RAID 1. Question 55. Which of the following cables is never used to connect a computer to an Ethernet network? So I've given you guys four kinds of cables there. In one of these four, you don't use it to connect your machine to an Ethernet network. All right, so is it answer A? Uh, yes, that is the answer, guys. So I should have probably made that answer D now that I think about it. So a rollover cable does in fact exist. All four of these cables actually exist. But a rollover cable is normally what you would use to connect to various assorted network equipment. This can be something like a firewall, maybe a network switch, that kinds of stuff. So we normally plug that into the console port of a device. A rollover cable is also known as a console cable because we plug it into the console cable. Normally, we would use these rollover cables with laptops. I mean, you can if you, if you want to. You can use it with a desktop PC. But since we normally have to go into a server room, nobody's going to want to have to carry a desktop PC into a server room. That's just very inconvenient. So instead, what I normally do is, and I, I assume most technicians do this, you walk into a server room with a laptop, you plug the rollover cable into your laptop while you're holding it in the air or putting it down on the table, and then you plug that end into the console port of the network appliance. Now, the part that plugs into the service or the network equipment, it looks like a normal RJ45 jack, but the part of the cable that plugs into your machine, that does not look like an RJ45 jack. It looks like a serial port because it is. It's also known as a console port. Now, most laptops and desktops these days do not have those ports, at least not anymore. Many moons ago, machines actually used to have ports for that. Um, oh, by the way, it's also called a COM port. Never mind, a console port. So the one end's called a COM port, C-O-M, and the other end is called a console port. So the part of the cable that plugs into the network appliance, that's called your console port, and the part of the cable that plugs into your machine, that's called a COM port. So it needs to plug into your machine's COM port. Now, we don't have these ports anymore. So then what do we do? We use an adapter. Sometimes it's a small little adapter. It, it fits in the palm of your hand. Other times it's a small little adapter cable, roughly the length of your hand. So that's going to convert that COM port to something that you can actually use on your machine. USB, um, RJ45, basically along those lines. So just to summarize, a rollover cable cannot be used to connect your machine, like your laptop or desktop, to a network. It's used to connect your machine to a network appliance. Now, the other three answers there that's left, all three of those can be used to connect a computer to a network. Shielded is UTP, so that's a normal network cable, which just happens to be shielded. It uses RJ45 jacks on both sides. Straight through cable and crossover cable is pretty much the same thing. The one is just well twisted and the other one is straight through. They're both pretty much the same thing. It's just the connectors that's configured differently. So the one, if you look at straight through, the connectors will be the same on both sides. So whatever is on pin one on the one side will be on pin one on the other side and vice versa of all the other pins. Crossover is where the configuration is a bit different on both sides. So pin one and two being senders will be going to pin three and six on the other side, which are receivers and vice versa for both connectors. Anyway, folks, so we know the answer is A, but before I move on to the next question, here is a picture of what a console cable would look like, or should I say rollover cable. So if you're wondering what it looks like, there's a bit of a picture. I probably didn't have to put it in there, but since some of you guys might be confused by what this cable actually looks like, it does exist. <laughs> there is a picture for you guys. 
All right, so let's move on. Question 56. Which of the following is not a term for the process of combining the bandwidth of two or more network adapters to increase the overall speed of the connection and provide fault tolerance? All right, so I've got a bunch of fancy, fancy, complicated terms here for you guys. And most of these, maybe even all of them, no, nah, it's not all of them, but most of these are terms that we use that basically means we're combining the bandwidth of two cables, two links. We're combining those two cables together, and that's going to give you more speed. It's going to give you a sense of fault tolerance and redundancies. If one of these links breaks or something happens to them, then you're not going to lose a connection. Instead, the connection might just be a bit slower, but you're not going to lose connection. Now, out of all of these terms, these five that I've got for you guys, which one of these has got nothing to do with combining two different network cables, for example, together? Is it bonding? Bonding means you are combining cables together. That's a term we can go and use for that, so it's not bonding, guys. It is not B, nick teaming. Nick teaming is also a term we use to go and combine links. So sometimes we go and combine network cards. Other times we go and combine ports on a switch. Um, either way, if you look at something like nick teaming, that's combining network cards, but it's going to speed up the speed and it's going to give you redundancy. If you look at clustering, that's the only one here that has got nothing to do with combining two links or two network cards or two ports together. Clustering is combining two servers perhaps together. I'm going to go and combine multiple servers together. So it is a combination of things, but it's not in the sense of giving you necessarily more bandwidth. So bonding, nick teaming, link aggregation, and port aggregation is all the same thing. You can actually go and Google this if you want to, especially B, D, and E, those three especially, but bonding as well. All four of those is the same thing. It's like saying potato, potato, or tomato, tomato. It's the same thing. All of those comes down to combining something like network cards together to form or act as one, or combining multiple ports on a switch together to form or act as one. And at the end of the day, you're going to have two or more network cables that's going to basically be the same link. It's going to give you more speed, and it's going to give you redundancy. So in the event of one of these cards failing, or one of the ports on a switch failing, the link will not go down. Instead, the speed might just be a bit slower but the connection will not be broken. And whatever service or server you're trying to render, it's never, not going to be unavailable. Question 57. Which of the following types of VPN connection is the best solution for connecting a home user to a corporate network? Answer A there, guys, is indeed a form of remote connectivity, but that is not a VPN connection. That is software that you can go and install on one machine and then on another machine, and then from one machine, you can go and connect to the other machine. But you need to have the software installed on both sides. It is not a secure connection. It's a clear text connection in most cases. And you can go and control another machine remotely. You can actually go and control that machine remotely. It's the same as TeamViewer. It's the same as AnyDesk. All of those are examples of the same thing. Now, B, C, and D. Those three are all three legitimate VPN connection types that you can go and use. So if you look at answer B, that is to connect one single machine on one network to one single machine on another network. So it's a form of VPN connection. Answer C is to connect a single machine to a whole entire network on the other side. And answer D is to connect a big entire network on the one side to a whole entire network on the other side. Now if you look at the question here, we've got a user. So in other words, a single user who is at home and he or she would like to access their corporate network. So probably the whole network of the office. So it's going to be a host. It's not a site. This person does not want to go and connect their whole home environment to the office. It's one person. And that person is a host. So it's going to be between answer B and C. Now this one person at home would probably want to go and connect to the whole corporate network. So that's a site. So the answer here, folks, is C. It's a host to a site VPN connection. You want to connect that person at home with their one machine to the whole entire network at the office. Hence the name, host to site. Question 58. One of the users at Burning Ice Tech swipes a smart card through the reader connected to a laptop and then types a password to log on to the system. Which of the following actions is that user performing? All right, so is it auditing? No. 
No, folks. Auditing is more of like a log keeping kind of scenario. So what has the person done after they've logged in? It's going to keep logs of everything so that your auditors internally or externally can go and check everything. Accounting, very much the same thing, very close. So accounting is going to show you how much of something this person used, how much resources they used, also how long they were connected and all that. So we want to know what do we call it when this person swipes their smart card in the smart card reader and they enter a password. What do we call that concept? Is it answer C, authentication? Yes, guys, authentication is to prove you are who you claim to be or what you claim to be. And this is done by providing something you know, something you have, or something you are. And a password is something you know, and a smart card is something you have. It's going to prove the user's identity, that they indeed are who they claim to be, and that they indeed are the owner to that device or that account. So the answer here is C. Answer D is authorization. That's basically just to go and check what level of access someone has after they have been authenticated. In other words, privilege. What can they see and what can they not see? And what can they do and what can they not do after they've been authenticated? So the answer is C. Question 59. The secured version of hypertext transfer protocol, in other words, HTTPS, it uses a different port than the unsecured version of hypertext transfer protocol, which we just call HTTP for short. What are the default ports used by HTTP and HTTPS? All right, folks, so what I actually want to know here from you is what are the default ports that we use for HTTP and HTTPS? All right, folks, so just because we are talking about two things here, HTTP and HTTPS, that does not necessarily mean I'm just looking for two ports. Some of these do use more than one port, so just keep that in mind. So looking at this list of ports down below, which one of these ports are HTTP ports and HTTPS ports, or used by HTTP and HTTPS? Okay, so answer A is out. That is secure and encrypted, but it's used for SSH, secure shell and all that. Port 23 for answer B, that is Telnet. And port 25 is SMTP. Port 80 is HTTP, that's clear text web browsing, so that's one of the ports we're looking for. Port 110, that's POP3. And port 443, that's HTTPS. So the answers here, folks, is 80 and 443. So in other words, answer D and F. Question 60. A rogue DHCP server has been discovered at Burning Ice Tech. You have been called in to solve the issue. You have disabled the rogue DHCP server and now you still need to terminate all the rogue IP addresses that was issued by two client devices. Which of the following commands should you run on the clients? Now please take note, I said commands, not command, commands. So there's multiple commands you need to run on the clients to get rid of the old IPs and to get them new IP addresses. I kind of gave the answer away by saying it like that. So looking at these command prompt commands below, folks, which ones would that be? So what I'm actually asking here is what commands do we use to release the old IP and what commands do we use to basically acquire a new IP address? Answer A, guys, does not exist. There's no such thing as ipconfig forward slash lease does not exist. Answer B, that is a valid answer, and that is one of the answers. We'll get to that in just a second. Answer C is a fake answer, does not exist. I made that up. Answer D is a valid answer, and it's one of our answers. We'll get to that in just a second. And answer E, I made that up. So answer A, C, and E is completely made up. That's completely fake. So the answer here is B and D. So what you would first need to go and do is on every machine where the IP is now expired or an invalid IP, like in this situation, you first go into command prompt, you type in ipconfig forward slash release. It's going to take like one or two seconds in most cases. After that, you follow by typing ipconfig forward slash renew. So release is to release the old IP, the invalid IP or expired IP, and renew is going to ask for a new IP address. So it's going to send out a new broadcast message on the network. It's going to say, hello, is there DHCP? And this time, the correct real DHCP will reply and say, yes, I'm here. How can I assist? And it's going to issue a machine with a new IP address that's valid. 
So there you go, folks. Question 61. Which of the following connector types are used with fiber optic cables? So there I go again, asking you guys about fiber optic cable connectors. You might have noticed this is like probably the third or the fourth time I've asked this, but every time I give you different answer choices, so I'm really testing you guys on this. Sometimes there's more answers, like six, like right now. Other times I'll just give you four or five. And I mix the answer choices. I really want to see if you guys know which connectors are fiber. Because I can almost guarantee you, they will ask you about this. You definitely need to know all the different kinds of connectors you get. Not just for fiber, for coaxial, for normal LAN cables. In other words, CAT5, 5E, 6, 6A, all of those ones. You need to know what kind of connector each of these cables uses. You need to know your cable types as well. So you need to know what's the maximum distance each cable can go. When do you use which cable? You know, in the sense of EMI and that kind of stuff, in a sense of distance. So what's the maximum distance the cable can go? Which ones are immune to EMI? Which ones are completely immune to EMI? That's the kind of stuff you need to know for the exam. So make sure you know your cable types, the maximum distances, if they're immune to EMI or not, and if so, how much they're immune, that kinds of stuff. Anyway, guys, so if you look at the connectors down below, the answers is A, C, and E. So the only four I've actually asked in this video so far is ST, LC, and SC. SC is not actually listed here, but that's one I asked you guys previously. And then, of course, MT-RJ is also a fiber connector. And just be aware, you actually do get other ones out there as well. So those four that I've listed in this video is actually not all of them. So do yourself a favor and go and check what all the fiber cable connectors are because you're expected to actually know all of them for this exam. And A+, plus, in the A plus exams, if you guys haven't written that, ugh, it's not that bad. You actually just need to know three. So in the A plus exam, you just need to know ST, LC, and SC. That's the only ones you need to know for the A plus exam. But for the N plus exam, you're expected to know a bit more. You're expected to also know this MT-RJ, which is on the screen, as well as a couple of other ones, which is not on the screen or not in this video. So go look them up, guys. In case you're wondering, RJ11, in case maybe you probably forgot, that's for telephone cables. The F connector, that's for coaxial. And RJ45, that's probably the most well-known. That's for normal network cables. Cat5, Cat6, that kinds of stuff. Question 62. Which of the following would be used to forward requests and replies between a DHCP server and a client? So in other words, what I'm actually asking you guys here, out of the four we see here down below, which one of these is going to act like a middleman? I kid you not. One of these actually acts like a middleman. And we don't always have this, but in the event that you have more than one network and your DHCP happens to be only in the one network, that becomes a bit tricky in terms of dishing out IPs if you need to do that in both networks. So your DHCP is located in, let's say, network one, and it's able to dish out IP addresses in network one. But at the same time, you've got a second network, which is maybe called network two, and there's no DHCP there. So how can you get your one and only DHCP to dish out IPs in the second network as well? Because your DHCP can only be in one network. That, guys, is something called a relay. The relay is on the edge of the network. And it's going to basically act like a middleman here. It's going to do things on behalf of the DHCP and issue IP addresses on behalf of the DHCP. Now, looking at answer A, we know it's not answer A. We know the answer is B now. Range is also called the scope. That is from where to where are you going to be issuing. So in other words, how many IP addresses do you have? So how many do you have and where do they start and when do they end? So I might say my range is from 192.168.0.100. That's my first IP. And my last one will be dot 200. So I've got from 100 all the way to 200. So it's approximately 100 IP addresses I've got available. That's a range or an example of a range. Answer C, scope is the exact same thing as answer A. So A and C is literally the same thing. Answer D, lease. That is how long that IP address is valid for after it's been issued to a device. So normally DHCP IP addresses have a lease associated. It can be very long. The default is actually eight days, but normally companies will go make that approximately 24 hours. At least most companies will make it 24 hours. After 24 hours, this IP address expires and you will need to get yourself a new one or renew the old one. All right, folks, the answer is B. Question 63. You have to connect a Cat6 Ethernet cable 
to a device that only has LC ports. Now, LC, guys, is fiber. Which of the following will you have to use to get the job done? So I have CAT6. That's a normal network cable that you plug into your standard laptop or desktop. I need to be able to plug that into a device that only has LC ports. So it's a bit of a tricky one. So I need to essentially convert my normal network cable into a fiber cable. What do we use for that? Do we use a switch? No, we don't normally use a switch for that, guys. A switch is generally what you'll find in an office in the corner, maybe. And it's used to connect various machines together, but not to convert connections. A router can also be used like a switch, but we don't use it as a switch normally. A router is normally used to route your traffic over the internet, hence the name router. It routes your traffic over the internet. It acts as a gateway on your network. It's normally on the edge of your network and it converts your private IPs to public and your public IPs to private. It gets people inside your network to the outside, which is the internet. That's the purpose of a router. It's not to convert network cable types. A media converter, yes, that is the answer here, folks. You get many kinds of media connectors. The most common kinds you get is to convert one type of video signal or video connector to another. To convert, for example, a VGA port to a DVI port or to convert VGA to HDMI and so on. That's the most common ones you get. But you do get connectors out there that can in fact convert a normal Ethernet cable, in other words, RJ45, to an LC port. Very much possible. So I'll show you guys an example in just a second. Now, repeater, the last answer there, guys, obviously we know that's not the answer, but a repeater is just to rebroadcast the same signal to kind of extend the length of a cable. This is especially used of normal Ethernet cables since they can only go up to 100 meters according to CompTIA. In reality, we know it's actually just 80 meters approximately. So after approximately 80 meters or so, you can have to go and plug that cable into something like a repeater. In real life, we just normally use switches for that purpose, but a repeater would also serve the same purpose. Now, before we move on to the next question, here is a picture of what a media converter would look like for fiber and all that, but you get many kinds, guys. Feel free to go into Google and go run a search for different kinds of adapters or converters you get. Question 64. You would like to distribute user traffic across multiple web servers. Which of the following tools or devices would allow you to do this? All right, so we've got multiple web servers and we want to distribute traffic across these multiple servers. You know, they need to kind of split, you know, the load, so to speak. Is it a firewall? Will a firewall allow you to achieve that? No, guys. Firewalls controls the flow of traffic in a sense of security. So it's going to check where you're coming from, where you're going to, who you are, what kind of site you're visiting, you know, your IP address, your MAC address. But it's not used to go and distribute user traffic. A switch kind of distributes traffic, but it does not. A switch is just used to connect various devices together. To connect devices, not distribute traffic, just to connect different devices together in the same network. A router can do the same thing as a switch. It's obviously going to be a bit tricky since a router only has like four ports, but you can go and do it via the wireless function potentially for a router if you really want to do that. But in a nutshell, folks, a router is just used to go and route traffic across the internet, like I said one or two questions ago. The answer here is going to be answer D, a load balancer. It's used to split the load. So if you've got multiple web servers, let's say three, what you would do is you're going to have a load balancer between the users that are trying to visit your website and the website servers. So every time someone tries to visit your website, if you're hosting a website, he or she is going to land in the load balancer and the load balancer is going to at that point in time check which one of your web servers has got the least amount of load and it's going to throw that person onto that specific server. It's going to try and equalize the load at all points in time. And if you were to go and let's say turn off one of these servers for maintenance because something is broken or whatever the case might be, all the load on that server that's not just been turned off will be split across the other remaining servers evenly. And if you bring that server back up, in other words, you turn it back on, all the load on the other two servers, which is so much at that point in time, it's going to kind of be split evenly again between all the servers now, including that server that's not just been brought up. Question 65. Which of the following would be used to adjust resources dynamically for a virtual web server under variable loads? So it's kind of sort of cloud-related question, guys. 
So this question is kind of sort of for me to test you guys and see how well you know the basics of cloud, the cloud benefits, cloud characteristics, that kinds of jazz. So elastic computing, that is to very quickly and very easily increase the resources of something like a virtual machine or a server. So if it sees the load is suddenly higher on that server or machine, it's going to increase the resources, like increase the RAM, the CPU power, that kinds of stuff. And eventually when the demand goes back down, it's going to automatically decrease the resources. Now keep in mind in the cloud, you do pay for what you use. So if you don't use something, you don't pay for that something. So that is obviously why the cloud provider will go and decrease your resources again if you need less, because if you still have all that resources and you're not using it, you're going to be paying for it, whether you're using it or not. So if they see you no longer need all that extra RAM and all that oomph, then they're going to decrease it because that means your cost is going to go down. Isn't that nice? Now, that, guys, is actually the answer here. It's called elastic computing. That's going to adjust your resources automatically, dynamically under variable loads. So if demand goes up, it's going to automatically increase your resources. If demand goes down, it's automatically going to reduce your resources. Now, since I said earlier you pay for what you use, Yes, there is a chance you can get an unexpected surprise in the mail that says you owe us because maybe the demand spiked so freaking much to the point that you didn't even expect that and then suddenly you've got to pay for all that. So in case you are scared about that kind of thing, you can go and specify a limit, a cap if you will. You can specify it in monetary value or in resource amount. Now looking at the other answers here, which we know is incorrect, hybrid deployment is something we do also with the cloud but that's when you've got on-premises resources and at the same time you've got cloud resources of the same thing and you've linked these two somethings of one another. An example would be Active Directory. So you've got Active Directory on-premises, the old school one, and you've got Active Directory in the cloud, the new one. And you've now linked and synchronized these two bad boys of one another. That's an example of hybrid deployment. Answer C. Scalable networking, that means having the ability for you to go and increase resources on something like a server, for instance. So I wouldn't say we can't do that on-premises. We can, but on-premises, it takes forever and a day because you need to get the budget approved. You need to go and order that new server or the parts for that server, whatever it might be. And then eventually, you need to go and arrange for downtime. And then you're going to have to wait until that day comes, and then you can go and do it. And when you turn the stuff back on, something's always going to go wrong. In the cloud, you can nearly instantaneously increase the resources for an existing server, or you can just go and add servers, nearly instantaneously. And just like Elastic Computing, you can actually go and decrease these resources. On premises, if you go and scale up or out, because you can scale up or out, scaling up is to add resources to an existing server, scaling out is to add more servers. Now, on premises, once you do that, you're kind of stuck with it. You paid for that, you're stuck with it. In the cloud, no, not necessarily. If you go and add more service or you add resources to a server, you're not stuck with it. You can always go and scale back down or back in. And then you're obviously going to pay less again. The last answer there, guys, metered connection is the concept of you paying for what you use, which, which is what I've been mentioning this whole time. So you only pay for what you use. That's what metered connection is. Question 66. You have been tasked with implementing a policy at Burning Ice Tech which will provide guidance to an employee about restricting non-business access to the company's video conferencing solution. So what we're actually saying here is the company's video conferencing solution is only allowed to be used for business purposes, for work purposes. So if you want to go and use that video conferencing solution for something that's got nothing to do with the company or nothing to do with business, yeah they're not going to allow that. So what kind of policy can we go and implement at this company of mine to force people to only be allowed to use it for, well, work purposes? You'll find the same kind of policy on machines often. So if you go and issue your users with computers that belongs to the company, you'll find that often they've got to agree to this policy first before they're allowed to use this machine. So this would normally be at the Windows logon screen. So on the same screen where they would normally go and type in their Windows logon password, there's a policy there sometimes that they've got to agree to first before they can log in. That is the same policy that we're talking about here, guys. What do we call that policy? Is it a data loss prevention policy? No, guys. With data loss prevention policies, that's mostly used in the cloud. 
And with that, we can specify conditions and actions. So if someone tries to share something outside the company, it's not allowed to be shared, digitally speaking, like a credit card number or whatever, you can go in and specify that as a condition. Nobody's allowed to share that outside the company. They can only share it inside the company. If they try and share it outside the company, a condition would be met. And then you can go and choose actions as an administrator as to what needs to happen then if someone is in violation of that policy. But here, in this scenario, that's not applicable. Data loss prevention policies does not force the user to go and use this device or this video conferencing solution for only business purposes. It's got nothing to do with that. Answer B, acceptable use policy, also known as an AUP. That is, in fact, the answer here, guys. So when you force employees or users to agree to this acceptable use policy, you can essentially force them to only use your company asset for company purposes. So if they go and use this device for something outside work purposes, they can obviously land themselves in hot water. Answer C, standard operating procedures. So almost all companies have this. It's called an SOP for short. It's the way they do business. You might find that they'll have multiple SOPs in different departments. Each department has a different SOP that they've got to live and abide by. It's a set of rules. Who needs to do what and when do you need to do it and how do they need to do it? It's basically rules as to how to do your job, if I have to put it into a nutshell. And then the last answer there, which is obviously also incorrect, remote access policy. I think the name speaks for itself. So that's a policy with regards to remote access, from where are you allowed to access and under what circumstances and all that kinds of jazz. Question 67. While walking from the parking lot to an access control door, you see an authorized user open that door. Then you also notice that another person catches that door before it closes and that person then goes inside. Which of the following has taken place? Okay, so just to repeat, we've seen one person open the door the legitimate way. So that's a person that obviously works for this company. And um, they open the door by, you know, providing some sort of identification. And right as the door is about to close, a second person catches the door right before it closes. And then they basically sneak in there. What do we call that? Is it called shoulder surfing? No, guys. Shoulder surfing is usually when someone is nearby. This can, let's imagine this is happening to you. Someone is nearby and they're peeking over your shoulder to see what you're typing on a the screen. They want to see what keys you're pressing on a keyboard or what is on your screen. So they're normally standing behind you or at an angle behind you. Now, so yeah, they could literally stand directly behind you or it could be at an angle. And they want to see what you're typing. So maybe you're an ATM and you want to withdraw money and they're trying to see what your PIN number is. They want to see what keys you're pressing on the keyboard. Or they want to see how much money you've got in your account. I don't know. Either way, that's shoulder surfing. Tailgating is when you follow so closely behind someone that you can gain access without authenticating. And that's actually the answer here. Now, in this case, it was a human being, but tailgating can apply to other things as well, guys. This can even be a car. So maybe there's a car going through a boom gate of some kind, as an example. And there's a second car so freaking close behind the first car that right as the boom gate or the gate's about to close, the second car just kind of sneaks in there. That's also an example of tailgating. So the answer here is B, but looking at answer C, spoofing is forging. Forging something like forging your email address, forging your IP address, forging your MAC address. So when you forge something, that is spoofing. So if I send you an email now, pretending to be your bank, for example, and that email le legitimately looks like it's coming from your bank, that would be spoofing. Answer D, phishing. So I'm phishing for something sensitive, something of value. Many ways I can do this, but the most common example is to send you an email, once again, like your bank, and to ask you for stuff like your username and password. Now, many of these attacks, like spoofing and like phishing, are normally combined with one another. Spoofing is often combined with phishing, and phishing is often combined with spoofing. So if I send you just an email pretending to be your bank, but it looks like it's coming from an at Gmail address, that's going to look pretty suspicious. But if I send you an email pretending to be your bank, and it looks like it actually is coming from your bank, that might be more legitimate, and people might actually fall victim to that then. So if I send you an email pretending to be your bank asking for information, that is phishing. Or if I give you a phone call pretending to be your bank asking for something sensitive, that's also phishing, but it's a subcategory that we call vishing. Question 68. You are setting up a web-based application that needs to be continually accessible to the end users. 
which of the following concepts would allow you to ensure this requirement is met? All right, so just to summarize, we've got a web-based application here, guys, and we need to make sure this thing is always available, no matter what. How do we achieve that? Is that high availability? Yes, high availability means you double up on everything. You are going to have two network cards, two servers, two internet connections. You're going to have backup power, backup this and backup that. It's to ensure whatever service or server is being rendered is never unavailable. High availability is what we call that. Now, Nick Teaming does kind of achieve that, but it's not directly what that is. Nick Teaming is normally to get you more speed, more bandwidth, and a certain level of redundancy. But the main thing we call that specifically is high availability for this question. Snapshots, also sometimes referred to as checkpoints, is something we usually use in virtual machines. It's to allow a virtual machine to go to an earlier state. Think of it as a time machine. So if you've got yourself a virtual machine in something like, let's say, Hyper-V, and you want to go and put that machine back to an earlier state because maybe you broke something. Snapshots, or well, nowadays they call it checkpoints, is what you would go and use. So that's got nothing to do with this question. I randomly just put that in there. A cold site is a form of backup, or at least in most cases in IT, we refer to a cold site as a form of backup. You get cold sites, you get warm sites, and you get hot sites. A cold site is a form of backup, but it's one of the slowest forms of backup you get. So it's going to get you there eventually, but it's going to take days or even weeks to get your stuff back up and running again. So it's very, very unreliable in a sense of high availability. So if I said hot site here as one of the answers, that could have potentially been one of your answers. Question 69. Which of the following would be used to enforce and schedule critical updates with supervisory approval and include backup plans in case of failure? Now, we already know it's not answer B because I literally explained answer B a couple of questions ago. So we know acceptable usage policy just says what people are allowed to use um, company stuff for and what they are not allowed to use it for. So if it's like a company asset, what can you use it for and what not? That's got nothing to do with this question. So we can rule out answer B. And since we know we need to choose two answers here, we know it's going to be between A, C, and D. I can already tell you it's not C. Onboarding and offboarding policies. So that is when you hire people and you let people go. So in most companies, when they're hiring people, there's a certain policy that needs to be followed. And when they let people go, when they resign, they retire, or they get fired, there's a policy that needs to be followed there as well. So that's what onboarding and offboarding policies is. So folks, since we know it's not answer B and C, we know the answer is going to be A and D. So A is generally if anything in your company is going to change, hardware-wise, policy-wise, Anything that needs to change in your company is going to be change management. There's actual documents usually that needs to be completed for that. So if you're going to change a piece of hardware, let's say it's a hard drive in a, in a server, that's a change management document that needs to take place. If you're going to go and change some sort of schedule or anything really, there's a change management document that needs to be completed. It can be physical, it can be digital, it's usually going to be digital. And this is for various reasons. In case something goes wrong, you can always go and check where you went wrong. If someone did something naughty, we can go and check who this someone was because they would have had to complete this document, obviously. And if you look at answer D, business continuity plan. So in the event of a boo-boo, a failure, what is your plan of action? How do you get things back up and running? And how long does it take you to get things back up and running? So in other words, what's plan B? So in case the poop eats the fan here, what is plan B, guys? That's your business continuity plan. Hoping I'm not butchering that name. Question 70, the last one. Wowza, finally. Now, guys, just before we complete this last question, um, I am going to be making more question videos for you guys. Some of them will be on YouTube and some of them will be on my Patreon. So maybe go check out my Patreon too if you guys haven't. The link should be in the video description down below. And if you've got any questions about one of these questions, feel free to drop that in the comment section down below as well. And I'll try and answer your question as quickly as I possibly can. Um, alternatively, go check out my Discord server. That link is also in the video description down below. I am in my Discord server, and there's lots of other IT experts in that Discord server as well. So if you're studying for something like the N Plus course, that is a very good place to go and ask your questions. Or if you already completed N Plus and you want to go and help other people, you can go and help other people there as well. Fun community, go and check out. Anyway, moving on to the last question. An attacker is attempting to find the password to a network in Burning Ice Tech. 
by inputting common words and phrases in plain text to the password prompt. Which of the following attack types describes this action? So somebody is trying to break into my company here, guys. And this somebody is randomly just typing in actual words and phrases. Actual words and phrases. What do we call that? Is it a rainbow table attack? No, guys. A rainbow table attack is kind of when you've got like a predefined list of passwords which are very likely to get a hit. Now, that's not necessarily going to be actual words. These can be random symbols and stuff as well. So if you understand someone or something very well, you'll probably have like a list of predefined passwords that you know is very likely to get you in to this someone's account or this appliance or whatever it might be. So it's not A. B, brute force attack. That is to guess someone or something's password. You can go do that as a human, but we normally use software for that. And that's probably the most dangerous kind of attack you get. But brute force can literally be any symbols, any characters. So it's not answer B. Answer C, a dictionary attack. That is when you use actual words and actual phrases to try and get into someone's account. And that is the answer here, obviously. D, denial of service attack. It's got nothing to do with passwords. So A, B, and C, that's all three of them are password-based attacks. But answer D has got nothing to do with passwords. It is an attack you get, yes, but it's got nothing to do with passwords. That is going to deny you access to an actual service, like your print spooler. And when people try to print, they're not going to be able to print. That's an example of a denial of service attack. All right, folks, we finally made it to the end. So thank you very much for watching up until this point. I really, really hope you guys have learned something. I wish you all the best with your, your Network Plus exam. Please make sure you read the questions properly in the exam. So sometimes there's a one word, a specific word that'll make all the world's difference. They will, for example, put the word most in capital letters or the word least in capital letters. And that's going to make a huge difference in your answer. So make sure you check for that in the exam, guys. Also, keep a lookout for any new practice questions I might put on the channel. Keep a lookout on my Patreon as well, if you guys are a patron of mine. Um, on that note, guys, special shout out and thank you to all of you guys that's been supporting me in this channel. So for those of you that's that's gone to the video description down below and donated me a coffee or a milkshake, I appreciate that. To those of you just clicking on the thanks button below the video if it's available in your country, thank you very much. And then obviously a big shout out to all the Patreon supporters of my channel and all the PayPal donations. Thank you very much, guys. Here's a big fat list of all the Patreon supporters. Well, it's not all of them. The guys on the free tier don't get listed here. So if you are, so if you are on a paid tier, you'll be listed here if you want to. So there's many people that's on the paid tiers that just prefer to stay anonymous. They're not actually on this list. So if you guys want to be on this page, uh, you need to become a Patreon between tier one, two, or three. And then I'm normally going to ask you whether you want to be on this list or not. Uh, here's a list of the PayPal donors. So thank you very much, guys. Appreciate it very much. And then last but not least, guys, like I mentioned earlier, this channel does have a Discord server. It's in the video description down below. So please feel free to go and check that out if you have not done that. And with that, guys, I'm going to conclude this video. See you in the next video.